This you is John 844. This is a major underpinning leaders of the Pharisees, right? and others. Modern you of your university father's devil. Of course, this has tried been to undermine the Bible, twisted, of course, as a pro Gnostic verse. This is where some of the claims that Christianity is Gnostic comes from. And this is where a lot of the hatred of Jews also comes from within Gnosticism, within Islam, within Protestant sects, within uh, you, you name it. Right. Yeah. And remember, they try to say that what is written in John 8, 44 is you are of your father, the devil. So instead of saying you are of your father, the devil, you are of the father of the devil. So the Jews worship Yahweh. Yahweh is the father of the devil. Therefore, Yahweh is Right. Therefore, Jesus was Satan or therefore Yahweh is a greater Satan. So remember that this little twist here. Right. You are of your father, the devil. You are of the father of the devil. So understand that. Right. OK. So also I mentioned last week, Wycliffe, if you dive into I mentioned that Wycliffe <laughs> changed, changed Jacob to James. Right. To create separation from the Jewish history, the Jewish background, the Jewish root of of christianity now of course when you go into the life of wycliffe what you don't learn is that the man was certifiably insane wow. these ideas wow. were anything yeah. but christian so but these are these are topics i need to delve into but so there are things yes. you will discover about wycliffe that are unchristian in the extreme Come back here and do it brother do that one on wycliffe someone is saying you're going to do something on luther my channel is your channel come do it and then child bars as well Okay, so let us get to where we were last time. Okay, we've discussed this. So we end up here. Now I'm going to be discussing one or two things that we will not have time to go into. Now is not the time to go into that. I'm going to present certain arguments. I have reasons for saying so. I have huge amounts of evidence, but this is not the, the, the place or the, the forum for, for that particular argument. But I want to present to you a position that is, that is of relevance. Okay, so... The city of Ur. Okay, uh, I just realized I need to load up my Google Earth. Okay, Ur. This is the home of Abraham, right? So according to some Jewish and Muslim sources, Edessa or Urfa is what's called Ur Kasdim, the hometown of Abraham. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at this here. <clears throat> okay, let's go here. So Abraham is supposedly from this location, the great ziggurat of Ur, okay, in southern Mesopotamia, southern Iraq, right? Of course, prior to the 1930s in a man called Leonard Woolley, the home of Abraham was considered to be here in Turkey. For all of history, effectively, Abraham was assumed for various reasons to be here. And in the 1930s, Leonard Woolley insisted, and he had a lot of power, a lot of influence, access to a lot of money and influential people, and he managed to change the popular view and bend it to, well, bend the popular view to, to this location being the hometown of Abraham. There's every reason not to consider this the home of Abraham, but actually up here in the north in Turkey, above, just above the border of Syria, about 20 kilometers inside Turkey from the Syrian border. Okay, let's continue. So Rendsburg, very famous scholar, um, he is a... <clears throat> he's the he's a, he's a student of Cyrus H. Gordon. He points out that this location makes better sense of the biblical references, and it was always assumed until the 30s. If Terah, now Terah is the father of Abraham, and Terah, for some odd reason, right, for some odd reason, in the Quran, Terah becomes Azar. Not sure if that makes any sense, but the yeah. Quran speaks of Abraham's father, Terah, as Azar. We could also see Azhar, right? Al Azhar University. I'm assuming these are these two are connected, that they're the same, which would mean the illuminated ones, the shining ones. Right? So yeah, that's another thing people may not be aware of. Just to understand what he's telling you, if you're not familiar with the Quran, the Bible says Abraham's name is Terah, and I'm not going to be interrupting. Abraham's father's name. Abraham's father's yeah, name. Abraham's father's name is Terah, but not in the Quran. The Quran it's Azar. He's called Azar in the Quran. So why is Abraham's father called Azar in the Quran? Whereas in the Bible, his name is Terah. Well, your guess is as good as mine, but he's saying that Azar, Az, Azar and Azar the, comes from the word illuminated one. I just want you to understand what he, he's talking about. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to cut you off. I just want to clarify yeah. for No, me. no, that's fine. No, I prefer, I, pre I appreciate the interaction and the explanation because I, I, I miss things as well. I don't always explain things well. It's very important. So I actually want you to step in and give your thoughts as well. Okay, so now Muslims have a different explanation. They say, well, you know, it comes from Muhammad's sister's daughter's friends. Well, it's from his daughter yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But it makes no sense. Okay, yeah. so if Tara left, if, he, if Tara and family left Urkas Dim to travel to Canaan, but they stopped en route in Haran, then, of, then Urkas Dim should be north of Haran. Let's have a quick look at this. Okay, so basically, when they went to Canaan, now Canaan is here, okay? This is the land of Canaan here. So they went from here to Canaan there, but they stopped here first and then went all the way down to here because they probably, you probably went to pick up a loaf of bread or maybe buy a Netflix subscription. This was the yeah. only place. Or maybe the highway only went that way. They didn't have one that went across here yet. The Ubers just didn't travel that way. Who knows? But yeah, does it make sense? Sam, that they went from here to there to there when they were going straight to here. Yeah, exactly. It does okay. so. so they stopped in Haran. Now, 12 kilometers or seven miles northeast of Haran is the famous Neolithic Gobekli Tepe, the world's oldest known temple from approximately 10,000 BC. Wow. Now, the area was part of a network of the first human settlements where the agricultural revolution took place. Remember, we spoke earlier of a book on, on the Nabataean agriculture that was very important as well to the Petrans. On Nabataean agriculture was also important to the Yemenites because this was part of, I, I suspect there's a link here. This is why the whole agricultural thing is important. Now, because of its association with Jewish, Christian, and Islamic history and the legend according to which it was the hometown of Abraham, Urfa is nicknamed the City of Prophets. Okay, the city of prophets. Don't forget that would be up here, right? <clears throat> You're talking up here, this place here. Gobekli Tepe is here, and this is Urfa right here. Mm, city of prophets, interesting. City of prophets, yeah. We'll talk more about that as we go. Let's continue. So, now I want to note there was more than one Ur. We know of at least six places that had the name Ur in that region, most of them were in the north. Like five of them were in the north in Syria, Syria, Turkey area. Places named Ur are places linguistically close enough to be a candidate for the Abrahamic Ur, such as Ura, have turned up in numerous ancient inscriptions at Ugarit on the Mediterranean coast in modern Syria, at Nuzi, northeastern Iraq, at Alalah, Turkey, and most recently in the archive from Ebla in northern Syria, east of Ugarit. They found 5,000 tablets from Ebla, yep. not all are translated yet. The Ebla mm -hmm. tablets include references to a place called Ur, Ura, and Urao. Unfortunately, none of these references can be located with any precision. But the fine spots of the tablets indicates the cities were most likely in the central or northern Syria or southern Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. Central or northern Syria or southern Turkey. So we're looking at central or northern Turkey or southern Syria. You know, sorry, southern Turkey or northern Syria. That means this region here. Right? Mm. All near to Haran. Right? Haran is where Abraham, now also what's important, and this will be important later, we need to realize there's a Haran. Remember we spoke of the start of this whole thing here in Ethiopia. We started in Aksum, bless you. Right? Well, yeah. it's important to realize there's a Haran, Hiran, but same place, like, you know, named the same here next to Al Mahabisha from Ethiopia, Mahabesha, Ethiopia, oh. from Ethiopia or of Ethiopia, Hiran here, Hiran here. These two are linked, right, linguistically. So, Hiran is where Abraham, as he was then, or Abram, as he was then called, went with his father, Terah, after the left Ur in Genesis 11, 31. And there is no dispute regarding the location of Hiran. And the Turkish government has denied all excavation in Haran by archaeologists. Wow, how convenient. So they don't let anyone excavate that area? Yeah, yeah. I think people were finding things back in the day, and That's the Turks not... decided to put a full stop to it. So that That's... area is off limits. Yeah. That's so, terrible. Okay, now let's continue. 
Now, just briefly, this is a very short summary of the argument, which would, would, which would be a lengthy discussion on its own. But the Southern Ur, let's go back to that. So I cover this and get it out of the way. That's this here again, the Southern Ur, the Great Ziggurat. Actually, I will go here. Okay, so this is the Great Ziggurat of Ur. Okay, this is it here. You guys have all probably seen pictures of this, the Great Ziggurat. Of Ur. Yeah. Okay. Oh, You've all probably seen this. And it was discovered by this guy. Now, if I'm going to zoom out a little bit, you need to look at this guy's face. Wow. Look, this so, is not uh, evidence. Sorry. I don't mean to cut you up, but they, they found a ziggurat. That's that's what's pictures of it. They found it, huh? Yeah, this the ziggurat. So basically, he's the guy that excavated there, Leonard Woolley. Yeah. And I this is Leonard Woolley. This it's very hard to explain, but Man, I come from an industry, a career where where little things could literally mean the difference between life and death. And you 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 notice tiny things, and they tell you something. And there's just something about this guy's features, his face, the look in his face that just I've seen this before. In in you know, so there's something odd about this that just disturbs me. I want to mention a couple of things about the ziggurat. The most prominent. Feature of the site of Ur in 1922 was the high mound which covered the remains of the great ziggurat or stage tower dedicated to the moon god Sin or Shin. Okay, looks like a Crowleyite, Nicola. Exactly, exactly. There is something very that to me, there's something that tells a story about that look on his, his face. I've seen the same. If you look at Crowley, you look at Levey, you look at Blavatsky, you see this, and there are others as well, like uh, Manly P. Hall and so on. There's a certain it's a sign to me, at least. Look, it's not it's not concrete evidence by any means, but there is something about that that just that makes a little red light go off in my head. Okay. And one other thing I want to mention here. Now, what is interesting? Why did they call Jacob James and they left King Nebuchadnezzar, as someone asked, untouched? Think about that. Yeah. I mean, that's a difficult name. Why didn't they change his name to Frank or Miles? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Hey, Frank. Uh, I'll be frank with King me. Frank, King Oscar, right? That's, yeah. Why, why would he change Jacob to James? I mean, because it's too hard for people to pronounce. Yeah. So, exactly. Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. his successor and a devotee of the moon god, rebuilt the ziggurat, which Woolley suggested may have had as many as seven stages. Nebuchadnezzar also rebuilt many of the other buildings within the sacred heart of the city and followed a very ancient tradition by appointing one of his daughters as high priestess. Okay, this will come up again later. Okay, that's the ziggurat. Okay, that's the ziggurat. And also Nabonidus. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'll mention something here later. As you're going there, uh, can I just share something with the brothers? Sure, and sisters? Brethren, uh, please. Ask Holy Spirit to help you understand these facts. These are solid historical, textual, archaeological facts. One thing about Nebuchadnezzar, why I'm interjecting, when I think it's good for us to focus on what he's saying, I'll interject. Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> worshipped, as he told you, the moon god Sin. If you read the book of Daniel, chapter 5, this is something that astonished critical liberal scholars who thought Daniel was a hoax. I don't know if you're aware of this. Many people think that Daniel was not written by a man named Daniel, 6th century BC, 500 years before the birth of Christ. They think it's a hoax that was actually composed during the pre-Maccabean period, around 2nd century BC. In Daniel 5, it says, and I don't mean to take up too much time, I just want them to see how astonishing this fact is. In Daniel 5, it says that at the time when Babylon was conquered by the Medes Persians, Cyrus, Belshazzar was ruling. Now, up until recently, <clears throat> extra biblical sources did not mention Belshazzar. It turned out they found an inscription saying that Belshazzar was a son of Nebuchadnezzar. He was acting as king in place of his father because when Babylon got conquered, Nebuchadnezzar had gone to Arabia to worship the moon god Sin. Now, here's where you're going to see the supernatural accuracy of Daniel. Not only does Daniel get it right that Belshazzar was acting as king in Babylon when the Medes Persians conquered it, Belshazzar tells Daniel if he can interpret 
the writing on the wall. Minni, Minni, Tekel, Parson, because none of them could interpret it. He would give him the third highest position in the kingdom. Now notice, third highest. Why didn't he make him the second highest? Because Belshazzar was second in charge, so he could not give Daniel his position. He could only give him position number three. So not only was Daniel right, Belshazzar was acting as king, but this detail yes. shows that Belshazzar was acting as vice regent, as king in place of his father, because Nebuchadnezzar was the king, Belshazzar was the prince second, that's why he offers Daniel third position. So archaeology is confirming how accurate your Bible is. Keep that in mind. Yes. That's in chapter five. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, no, we'll we'll cover that again. We will come through that, but thank you. So I just want to mention some evidence here for this. So the Septuagint reflects a tradition connecting Abraham not with the Ur of the Chaldeans, but with the land of the Chaldeans, a designation that covers a much broader territory than the southern Ur. Okay, the Kaldu were a migratory group of Semites related to Arameans, and the tradition preserving the Septuagint, Septuagint prompts us to consider locations for Abraham's homeland more broadly than just the area where the Kaldu eventually settled. Now, the problem with equating Abraham's Ur with the Tal al-Muqayyar is that it cannot, it cannot easily account for the sheer weight the biblical tradition places on situating the ancestral home of Abraham and the patriarchs in the north. They mention you the scholar, Spicer bluntly states it is beyond serious dispute that the home of the patriarchs was in the district of Haran and not in the south. Okay. Now, okay, so I'll continue with this. Let me just go back here. So let's look at some biblical evidence. And there's other, so the southern area is on the west bank of the Euphrates. This geographical fact is significant because it sheds light on the biblical story of Abraham, his son Isaac, and his grandson Jacob. According to Genesis 24, 4, when Abraham was old, he dispatched his servant to the land of my birth, which is believed to be Ur, to find a wife for Isaac. The servant goes and he finds Rebekah, who was the sister of Laban, the first person to greet the servant. Later, Jacob, Isaac's son, travels to work for Laban, presumably in Ur. After working for Laban for 20 years, he goes back to Canaan, but had to cross the Euphrates to do so, according to Genesis 31, 21. But if the southerner is located on the west bank of the Euphrates, it is not necessary to cross the river. Therefore, it is unlikely that Abraham's servant was sent to the southern Ur, as it does not align with the biblical account. There is no reason to cross the river here. Ergo, the southern Ur cannot be the place that Abraham sent his servant. Now, there's a lot more. I mean, there's pages and pages and piles to go over, but Woolley, for some reason, insisted on changing the geographical location. So now, of course, he was also very closely related to T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. But when you wow. read about Lawrence of Arabia and you learn about his, shall we say, religious beliefs, you start to, Lawrence's views are a little odd, let's just say, just slightly strange and mysterious, right? So let's, let's leave that at that for now. So. Joshua 24.2, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates river and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him through Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac. Okay. Now, Gobekli Tepe, one of many Tepe. So this is Gobekli Tepe here. Okay. San Lurfa is just here, right? This is it right here. Now, notice there's more than one tepe. There's at least 19 of these that are known. At least 19 of these temples that are known in this area. So this area, now people will say Gebekli Tepe was buried for 12,000 years and only recently discovered, you know, in the last century, right? However, this area has dozens, dozens of these locations. So the people must have known of these because not all of them covered, not all of them were, were secret, not all of them were buried, right? So this area is well known to have had a long his historical religious tradition connected to paganism and star worship, right? This is Gobekli Tepe right here, right? Now, another site that is even older than Gobekli Tepe was unearthed in Turkey. They speak of discoveries at Buntuk Dutaria Otala in southeastern uh, Martlin are around 1,000 years older than those in Gobekli Tepe. This is according to um, Turkish world, world culture. This is a Turkish website or government website or news website that says there's an even older location. 
So this is, and this is over here. Okay. So you have very old locations. The, this picture and these things are from official sources. This is from the Delhi Sabah, but <clears throat> all of these are taken from official sources from the, the guys who are managing the archaeological and university sites, uh, government sites that are managing this dig. Now, to move on, 9,000-year-old shrine in Jordan, Asillam. Wow. These are, this is a 9,000-year-old site. This is Jordan. So this is, wow. Wow. This is Israel here. Qumran caves around here. This is the site here. Okay. So Jibala Kashabia, French and Jordanian archaeologist, made a unique discovery that sheds new light on daily life and belief in the prehistoric Levant. Wow. Graven idols and pillar statues. These are graven idols and pillar statues. Right? What does it say in the Bible? Yes. You can't not have graven, graven, images. Yeah. graven images and sacred stones. And here I'm seeing eye, eyeballs on some of these, or at least some figures on these images. Right? So these are graven idols. Yeah. This is a 9,000-year-old Neolithic site. And notice, what is this called? Sillim. Sounds familiar. Nothing to do with Islam. Salam, Sillim, Islam. Nothing to do at all because it's 9,000 years old, boy. Yeah, nothing to do with, 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 the, with the religion that has a name with the root SLM. Okay? Yeah, exactly. So, and notice how close it is to Petra. Petra again? Very close to Petra. Confirming Dan Gibson's research that the Quran's actual context, historical context, is in Petra. I don't think it starts in Petra. I think it personally. I think it's Yemen. There's no, they're not saying there's no link. I'm not saying that he's not so, but yeah. I believe the yes, earlier source right. would be Yemen, yeah. and that's the that's the case I'll be making. But this religion was widespread, north and south. I'm going to be tying north to south, because most of these people have looked after the seventh century and in the north. None of them, until I believe I came along, started to compile all the evidence that showed south and even earlier. No one was going from the 6th century or the, the previous millennium. So hmm. let's continue. So now we're going to look at Abraham as a patriarch. So let's look into the life of Abraham. Short synopsis of Abraham's life. According to Jewish tradition, Abraham was born under the name Abram in the city of Ur in Babylonia in the year 1948 from creation, circa 1800 BC. Son of Terah an idol merchant, but from his early childhood, he questioned the faith of his father and sought the truth. He came to believe that the universe was the work of a single creator, and he began to teach this belief to others. Abraham tried to convince his father of the folly of idol worship, and when he was alone one day to mind the store, he took a hammer and smashed all the idols. He placed the hammer in the hand of the largest idols. When his father came back and asked what happened, he says the idols got into a fight, and the big one smashed the little ones. His father said, don't be ridiculous. These idols have no life or power. They can't do anything. And Abraham replied, then why do you worship them? Eventually, the one true creator that Abraham had worshipped called to him and made him an offer. If Abraham <laughs> would leave his home and his family, God would make him a great nation and bless him. He accepted the offer and the brit, or the covenant between God and the Jewish people was established in Genesis 12. Now, I should mention to you that the pagans make a distinction between the idol and the God. The idol is a home for the God. Yeah. They do a ceremony. Um, the Egyptians would call it the opening of the mouth ceremony. And this ceremony brings the spirit of the God into the idol. It localizes that God to that location. And thus the idol, even though it's still stone or piece of wood, it is alive. It is now alive and animated with the presence of the deity. So there's a separation, a distinction between the deity itself and the idol. If the idol is broken, the deity does not die. Simply a new idol is made, a new home, right? That's how idolatry works. Any thoughts on that, Sam? Just so I want you, because I want to connect it with the beauty of, of the scriptures. So when they would make an image, an idol, the deity would enter through the mouth of the idol, almost like breathing life into it. It's his presence, right? Mm -hmm. So because the reason why I want the people to see how revolutionary the Bible is. You understand what he just said? This is actually, he's giving you actual facts. These are based on the sources from the pagans themselves. An image was made of the deity, and that deity <clears throat> would then inhabit that idol, sort of like breathing his or her life into it to make that idol <clears throat> just permeated with the presence of that God. So if that image was destroyed, the God still existed. You would just make a new image for the God to inhabit. Now compare that to Genesis, brethren, where God created man male and female to be his image. 
And then he breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, animating man, making him a living soul, so that the Bible is revolutionary in saying that it's not the statue, the idol that God inhabits, but God's presence fills and animates human beings because human beings are the living images of God. You see how revolutionary the Bible is yes. in its historical context? Now, sorry, guys, I'm a little under the weather because of my... Yeah. Uh, continue, brother, so God is against idolatry, and Muslims love to claim... That Christianity is idolatry, not just the spirit, but the fact is that they have idolatry within their deen, and they want to say, well, Christianity does it too, so therefore it's okay. So, yeah. so really, um, so understand, Christianity was from the from biblical times. The God of the Bible was against idolatry, the idea of localizing, because God is not localized; God is universal. Amen. So, okay, the idea of berit is fundamental covenant is fundamental to traditional judaism we have a covenant a contract with god which involves rights and obligations on both sides we have certain obligations to god and god has obligations to us the terms of this berit became more explicit over time until the time of the giving of the torah abram was subjected to 10 tests of faith to prove his worthiness for this covenant leaving his home is one of these trials he was then raised as a city dweller he adopts a nomadic lifestyle traveling through what is now the land of israel for many years God promised this land to Abraham's descendants. We will do maps on this. We're coming to all of that. Abraham is referred to as a Hebrew or Ivri. And we've mentioned that this if, Ivrit, the Muslims made it Ifrit, which made it a demon. Possibly because he was descended from Eber or because he came from the other side, Eber of the Euphrates River. Okay, so there's that. Okay, so Abraham is exalted father, but Abraham is the father of a multitude. Right. Now, we will show, and I believe I have shown previously, that this a title, this idea is actually ascribed to Muhammad and his family, right? We're shown within the Sirah. But Abraham was concerned because he had no children and he was growing old. Abraham's beloved wife, Sarai, knew that she was past childbearing years, so she offered her mid servant, maid servant, Hagar, as a wife to Abraham. This was a common practice in the region at the time. According to tradition, Hagar was a daughter of Pharaoh given to Abraham during his travels in Egypt. She bore him a son, Ishmael according to both Muslim and Jewish tradition, is the ancestor of the Arabs, Genesis 16. When Abram was 100 and Sarai 90, God promised Abram a son by Sarai. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, father of many, and Sarai to Sarah, from my princess to princess. Sarah bore Abram a son, Isaac, in Hebrew, Yitzhak, a name derived from the word laughter, expressing Abram's joy at having a son in his old age. Isaac was the ancestor of the Jewish people. Abram died at the age of 175. Okay, that's the story. Let's continue. Now, Abraham's journey. Right? So the Sharia, the Islamic law, makes explicitly the claim that Islam is Gnostic. Now, people do call Gnosticism religion, and I will refer to it as such here and there, but really, it is not religion. It is revision. It's an alternate interpretation of reality. Islam is also revisionist. It alters biblical figures and events that stem from earlier traditions. The right. sources of Islam predate it by hundreds of years at a minimum. Archaeological discoveries validate the biblical narrative, not so with the Quran, not at all. Abraham migrated from Ur, maybe Mesopotamia, Lower Euphrates Valley, common story, as I said, my preference is the north, north to Haran. Haran is the name of Abraham's deceased father. Now that is, okay, now deceased brother, sorry, my bad. Now what is odd, Haran is the name of Abraham's deceased brother. Yes. Now if they came from here, why is Haran not here? Why? Now, what is interesting is that there's at least three towns in this area that are named after the family of Abraham. These are ancient towns that are named from the lineage of Abraham's family. So why would he have multi... If, if they just stopped here for a, for a box of cigars on the way to yeah. the Canaan, right? Yeah. In that 10-minute stop at the 7-Eleven to buy a Coke. Exactly. How did they so, suddenly... The visitors, how did everyone decide, hey, we've got to name three towns after, after this family? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because the Slurpee got to their heads. See, when you drink too much Slurpee, brain freeze. Yeah, exactly. So he then traveled to Canaan, later renamed to Israel. Babylon worshipped numerous gods, and in Haran, there was a moon god called Sin, among other names. Mm. Right. So this moon god Sin got around. This mm. moon god called Amaka, right, got around. Let's continue. The basic story, the common story is this one, at least the story from the 1930s. The story from the late 1930s onwards is 
Abraham started here, went up here, stopped here for a slurpee, as you said, came down to Egypt and went back here. Because he was going here. I don't know why he didn't just go here. Right? Them slurpees, man, I'm telling you, has nothing to do with Islam. But you don't listen. Okay, Google Maps wasn't working so good those days. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay, let's continue. So, Hagar and Ishmael. So, a bit of a lengthy section here with reading, but Genesis 21, okay? Abraham was 100 years old. His son Isaac was born. Now, as we know, Sarah was unhappy with the way that Ishmael was treating her son, um, Isaac, right? And what happened is she tells Abraham, look, she's got to go. Okay, her son is abusing our son. In fact, within the within tradition, um, Ishmael tries to kill Isaac, hmm. tries to shoot him with an arrow. Okay, oh, wow. so they get told to leave. So now basically Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and one bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and a child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast off the child under the shrubs. She sat down against him a good way off as if it were a bow shot for she said let me not see the death of the child and she sat over against him and lifted her voice and, and wept now don't forget she is in mecca she's yeah. at the zamzam well which yeah. is the oldest city in the world which has been continuously inhabited since adam built the city right and the kaaba has been there as the oldest temple in the universe yeah. and <laughs> you know he's joking guys he's making fun of muslim islam now you may think he's being serious. He's making fun of Muslims because supposedly Beersheba is Mecca and the well is Zamzam. Nothing to do with Gnosticism. I mean, it's not. Yeah, we're going to get into all of this. So, so God hears the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Lift up the lad, hold him in thine hand, for I'll make him a great nation. And Allah, <laughs> God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the boy a drink. And God is with him, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him, a wife, out of the land of Egypt. That's the biblical story in Genesis. Okay, so now this is Beersheba, okay? Jerusalem is up here, okay? This is this section of the world here. So this is Israel, right? Jerusalem is right here. And this is Beersheba. This is about, I don't know, 70 kilometers from Jerusalem. This is Hebron here, where Abraham died. This is Hebron. Okay, let's continue. So this is Abraham sending away with a jug of water, loaf of bread. He sends her away. Now, according to the Islamic story, she went on a 1,200 kilometer trek by foot across some of the harshest desert in the world. I've been down here. I've, I've traveled a lot of this region. Okay. So she walked 1,200 kilometers with a bottle of water and a little boy. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. more sense. Because remember, they had the Burak, you know, that half mule, mm. half horse, whatever it was that Muhammad rode on. So Burak was like their Uber, so provided rapid transportation. What's wrong with you? If Abraham could do it, go to Mecca for a few minutes and go back and come back, back again. Come on. You're yep, skeptic. Yep, yep. You sound like an atheist. So yeah. instead of Beersheba, so this is very close to Jerusalem here. Jerusalem is around about here. This is Beersheba. You can see the distance. That's reasonable. But apparently she walked 1,200 kilometers. In fact, more than 1,200 kilometers. Let's continue. So now have a look here. Hebron, okay, where Abraham died, to Beersheba is 43 kilometers. This is like the home of Abraham here. Jerusalem to Beersheba is 70 kilometers or 43 miles. So you're looking at 43 kilometers, 27 miles, or 70 kilometers, 43 miles right, to yeah. the, the area around Beersheba. Muslims want to claim she walked 1,200 kilometers yeah. across harsh desert. So she walks 1,200. So Muslims are taught that the well where she got the water is the Zamzam well in Makkah. Hagar, an infant Ishmael, traveled 1,200 kilometers with one bottle of water on foot across arid, uninhabited, harsh desert. In the sin, in the standard Islamic narrative, Abraham walks them there, then leaves them under a tree with some Ajwa dates, obviously, because Ajwa dates will keep you okay. And he walks yeah. back 1,200 kilometers. Okay. Now, now, brother, you forgot, though. Muhammad yeah. said if you eat seven Ajwa dates a day, 
then magic will have no effect on you. So you didn't, you didn't, you're not seeing this because you're a skeptic, you're an unbeliever. Ajwa is to protect them. If they had at least seven a day, then magic could not affect them, Lloyd. Man. You're skeptic. right, you're right. And in fact, sister in Christ is that Zamzam water, the more you drink, the more you have. Yeah. It's recycled water. Yeah, I, sure. Why well, are you fun. acting like an atheist when it comes to Islam? Oh, you have little faith. Yeah, so Allah also forgets Hagar is not mentioned by name in the Quran. And as you yes. know, the Quran is perfect. It has all the information. And so ask any Muslim, uh, you guys claim Muhammad had X number of wives and these are their names, right? And you, you obviously say this is true. Can you show me their names in the Quran, please? Just give me a list. It doesn't exist. So, so yeah, you know, the Quran is everything we need. Yeah, sure, buddy. Okay, so Quran in the Islamic story is the Hejaz, right? So Hagar searches for water between Safa and Marwa hills. Muslims tell us that Ishmael's heel touched the ground and opened up a well. So Ishmael's heel hits the ground and opens up a well. They also tell us it was an angel's heel that opened up the well. They also tell us it was an angel's wing. The angel was digging a hole with the wing that opened the well. And they also tell us Mecca is the oldest inhabited city on earth. And the Kaaba is the oldest temple on earth. It's always been there. It's been there since the time of Adam. Now, here's the thing. In the Quran, it says, Oh Lord, I've settled part of my descendants in a barren valley by your sacred house, the Kaaba, that they may maintain the prayer. However, in the Islamic story, there is no Mecca. There's no so, life, no people, no Kaaba. This story makes absolutely no sense. It is ridiculously obvious that this is just fiction. And this Islamic narrative is dated at earliest to 827 AD. Yeah. Let How many me, years after Muhammad's did, death is this? This is 195 years. Yeah, let me explain why you said 827. These claims about Mecca are found in the Hadith literature, like Bukhari Muslim. And the Hadith literature comes from the 9th century, 800s. That's what he's telling you. So understand the connection, what he made, brethren. Chapter 14, verse 37 of the Quran, just to reinforce your point, because you're bringing up superb points that you apologists need to remember. In chapter 14, 37, this is Abraham saying that he settled part of his descendants in this barren valley. Okay, descendants, okay, in this barren valley. All right. Well, according to the Islamic sources, this area was barren. There was no one dwelling there when Hagar and Ishmael decided to go... <clears throat> By foot, well, over 1,200 kilometer, kilometers away from where they initially were drinking Slurpee on the way. And supposedly, this barren valley is Mecca. And then the angel miraculously <clears throat> caused Zemzem to gush because with his heel, he hit the ground. And, but all of this is not in the Quran. Understand what he's telling you guys. It's not in the Quran. It comes from these sources that come 200 years later after the death of Muhammad, if we can date Muhammad's death to the 600. So pay attention to what he's telling you. So go ahead, bro. I just wanted to catch well, this. Thank you. No, that's that's good. No, I appreciate it. Because I, I like the fact that you corroborate what I say. Yeah. You know, that, that I mean, because I would expect that you would immediately say, look, that's false. You know? No, no it's true. But, Your sources on Mecca and the Kaaba and Hagar and Ishmael and Jibreel, you know, striking the ground with his heel. That's not in the Quran. None of that is in the Quran. Nada. Zip. It's in the Hadith literature that comes 200 years plus after the reported death of Muhammad. So keep that in mind. Ninth century sources. Ninth century AD. 800s. Yeah. So I'm going to mention something. We will come back to some of these. I will repeat some of these points because people do forget and it's worth repeating in context. Yeah. I want to show this is the Kaaba here. This is the Hatim. Right, this will be important later. The Zamzam well is here. You can't quite see it, but this little section that's the Zamzam well. Right now, according to Islamic tradition, Hagar and Ishmael are buried right here. Let me let me zoom in here. Okay, let me bring this over. Hagar and Ishmael are buried right here, literally next to the wall of the Kaaba inside the Hatim. Right now, here's the thing there's lots of We'll discuss this at length in the future, but Muslims could simply just show us archaeological evidence of their bodies right there. Exactly. Why haven't they done so? That's a good right? question. And also, if she, if the Zamzam wall is here, they were less than 40 meters. They were 30 meters from the Kaaba. 
Why is there no mention of this Kaaba? Well, and if they are inside the world's oldest city, why is there no mention of this city? Yeah, within the Islamic sources. So, uh, this Muslims, I mean, this is this is going to be a major issue for them to explain this. There's no this. Seriously, this is a serious problem for them. Let's continue. So, speaking of contradictions, what's about all those? What about all of those found between Hafs and Wash and all the other Kiraats? Okay, fine. There's, there's 37 different Quran variations we know of. Okay, let us not forget Abraham traveled all the way from Israel to Mecca, and then he built the Kaaba, or maybe he rebuilt the Kaaba, but yeah. then he had to smash the idols that had been put inside it. Although the Kaaba was built for Allah alone, and Abraham built it just for Allah. But then he decided, no, I'm going to put 364 other idols in there too. Or Abraham or Adam built it. But now which came first, the building, the rebuilding, or the smashing up of the idols? Yeah. Right? Then Hagar. <laughs> sorry, Sam? I want to understand what you mean, rebuilt it. Because a lot of the Christians don't understand in Islamic tradition what they believe the Kaaba. Now, I, brethren, what he's asking is, did Abraham build the Kaaba with Ishmael or rebuilt it? Now, why is he saying that? According to Islamic tradition, pay attention, because now when Lloyd is speaking, he's already assuming you have enough knowledge about Islam so that he doesn't have to clarify. And he's right to assume that because if you've been following these channels, you should know this. But in case you're new here, the Islamic tradition says that Adam actually built the Kaaba. The Kaaba was there even before the flood of Noah. So what Abraham and Ishmael did, they rebuilt it. So Abraham did not build it, he rebuilt it. That's why he keeps saying. So did Abraham build the Kaaba or rebuild it? Because there are Islamic traditions that say Adam actually, who landed in India when he was thrown out of, this is an Islamic tradition, by the way, I'm not making it up. When Adam was thrown out of Jannah, he ended up in India, but went to Arabia, built the Kaaba, and then Abraham comes later and rebuilds it. So that's why he's asking the question. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. And then, of course, Muhammad or Abraham has to smash a bunch of idols. Muhammad has to do it again later. But Abraham has to smash idols, right? Although it was built for Allah alone. So we'll get to that story as well. Now, which came first, the building, the rebuilding? Okay, so Hagar is running around the desert looking for water between Marwa and Safa. The Zamzam well was granted to her, except this is 30 meters away from the Kaaba, or rather the ruins of the Kaaba because Abraham rebuilt it, or maybe he built it. We're still trying to figure this out. This means that it could not be a Mecca at that time because she was close to the Kaaba and was in the desert. This means that the desert had reclaimed the area of Mecca, meaning it was abandoned or not there at all. But Mecca is the oldest city in the world since the beginning, and it's always been there. And then, of course, the Quran, sorry, the Islamic tradition tells us that people were much taller back then and they got yeah. shorter. That's okay. Right. So, in other words, Adam Abraham, Zilla. Adam Zilla, Abraham, sorry. Adam was 36 meters tall, or roughly 90 feet tall. So, of course, over time, people got shorter and shorter and shorter. I don't know how tall Abraham was, right? Kerry lays on, yes. Yeah. So, the fact is now, if Abraham was 90 feet or 36 meters tall, why would he build a Kaaba that was too small for him to fit inside? Yeah, that's when someone asked that question exactly. He's anticipating your objection. Yeah. He's like, oh. A 90-foot Adam built a small Kaaba? How? Yeah, for, for what? For whom? For, for ants? For midgets? I mean, what? I yeah, mean, exactly. seriously, because we, we're looking here at, this is Zoolander levels of questions, you know? Yeah, exactly. You're building... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Nothing new with Islam, though. Keep that in mind. Nothing new with Islam. That's new with 7-Eleven and Slurpees. Don't forget. Okay. So now, there's none of this in the Quran, and there's none of this. There's no explanation for these contradictions. I've asked Muslims about this, and then they uh, go silent on me. Okay, let's move on. Now, according to Islam, no prophet or warner was sent to Arabia. That's why they had to send Muhammad. Abraham and Ishmael went to Arabia, and they're both Muslims. And they, yeah. Abraham was a prophet. So, okay, but no prophet or warner was sent to Arabia, except Abraham, the patriarch, who went there with Ishmael, who is also a, I, I don't know, my, my brain's starting to hurt. And it's a 90-foot, 36-meter Adam was the first Muslim in Mecca, and he built the tiny Kaaba. Then Abraham went there with his son and rebuilt the Kaaba and called pe people to worship Allah, according to Quran 397. Why does the Quran in 3440 say, and we had not given them any scriptures with they, which they could study, and we had not sent to them before you any warner, or to whom no warner had come before? And if there were people there, where were the people when Hagar got there? Let me emphasize the point you made. Guys, this is a brilliant statement. Please, brethren, listen. 
and I hope you don't mind if I just reinforce what you're saying. According to the Quran he just quoted, brethren, chapter 34, verse 44, did you catch it in 2846? Pay attention. Quran says, Muhammad came to a people that had no warner sent to them. Meaning before Muhammad, this group did not have a prophet, messenger, warner sent to them until Muhammad. How can that be? Understand the argument, brilliant argument. How can that be if the Arabs in Mecca and Medina, Mecca specifically, descended from Ishmael? Because if their descendants Ishmael, that means Abraham and Ishmael would have already taught them the religion of Islam because the Quran says Ishmael was a prophet and the prophets were given scripture and Ishmael taught his descendants to prayer. That means they would have had a warner. They would have had a prophet because they're descendants of prophets. Abraham was a prophet. Ishmael's a prophet. And Ishmael enjoined on them prayer and worship and was given a scripture. How do you reconcile that, Muslims? Because you're saying Muhammad came to a people who had no warner, but then you're saying they're descendants of Ishmael and Abraham. So they had two warners, Abraham and Ishmael, and they're given scripture and they knew the religion in your face. Nothing right. to do with Islam. Yeah, now it should also be noted. Now, again, so it should also be noted. Muslims claim that anywhere between 72 or so, 70, I don't know, pick a number, anywhere between 70 and 300 prophets are buried in this area. Muslim tradition states that somewhere between 70 and 300 prophets are buried here. So if there are 300 prophets buried next to the Kaaba, hey, show me the evidence. I'd love to yeah. see a, a radar scan. Dig one up. If Adam is buried here and he's 19 feet tall, show me the skeleton. I will say the Shah Na Na tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you forgot, a Adam shrunk, dude. You can't expect him to be 90 feet. He shrunk when he came down. Come on. Man. You mean he fell so hard? The Yeah, he shrunk, okay. dude. Man. My goodness. You're such a nitpicker. <laughs> My brain, please stop. Okay, so if there's so if there are three hundred prophets here who all came before Momo, what did they mean they don't they didn't get a warner? Okay, moving on. Wasn't Abraham and his son a warner? Okay, what about Adam who's buried there and all the other prophets that are buried there? And Ishmael and his mother are buried next to the Kaaba in the Hatim, according to Islamic tradition. So this is the Kaaba, this is the Hatim, and they are supposed to be buried within three meters of the wall of the Kaaba. Oh. Okay. This is the Hatim right here. I would love to see the evidence. So, you know, if Mr. Muslim would just please show me the archaeological evidence, I will say the Shah Na Na tomorrow. Right. Yeah. I, um, AG. Okay. Now, let's go to Wikipedia. Now, obviously, Wikipedia, Wackypedia, as I call it most of the time, not always the best source, but man, sometimes it is very good. Sometimes yeah. it's terrible. But let's look at this article, a Wikipedia article called Ancient Towns in Saudi Arabia does not list Mecca, nor does it list Medina for that matter. It says 13 ancient towns have been discovered in Saudi Arabia up to the present day. These include Qariyat al Fau, which is really fascinating because we've mentioned and we will mention Qariyat al Fau again when we talk about paganism, when we talk about the moon god Sin, the Mesopotamian moon god, and how the Yemenis invaded and this was their capital. And this city exists today. And they controlled this whole region and they worshipped the moon god of Babylon, the same mm. god of Babylon up here. And this was the capital. So they mentioned Qariyat al Fau. Okay, we'll talk about that more later. Al Ukhdud, archaeological area. Hegra, Mada in Saleh, okay, up here. Juba, Tarut, blah, blah, blah. Tema, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And Makkah, the mother of all cities, is absent from this list. Yet the, all of these other places are well attested historically. Interesting. Isn't that a strange oversight? Yeah, that's amazing. And this is something that, <clears throat> so they found evidence for these places, but they didn't find any mention of Mecca, even in Arabia. Wow, that's amazing. Medina. Wow, that's, it's, it's, that's amazing. Now, uh, how, how are they going to explain this uh, oversight? I don't know, but that's their yeah. problem. So we'll continue. Right. So Burak Airways. Right. So Hagar walks 1,200 kilometers to Egypt to get Ishmael a wife. So don't forget, she just walked down here. Now she's got to go all the way up here. Then she's got to go all the way down here to here. Then she's got to come all the way back and back here. Okay, that's a little bit of walking. 
right? Yeah. So in Genesis 25, 9, and his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the caves of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre, which is Hebron. Okay, this is Hebron right there. Okay, roughly 30, 40 caves from Jerusalem, right? Let's continue. So Abraham dies in Hebron. How did Ishmael know? Well, obviously they, you know, cell phones. Ishmael walked 1,200 kilometers for the funeral and back. How was he aware that Abraham was dying? Ibn Kathir says, Abraham often rode upon the Burak to Mecca, coming suddenly to his son and then returning, and Allah knows best. Okay? Now, Ibn Ishaq's tradition about Abraham riding on the Burak to Mecca, where he visits Ishmael, is found three times amongst the sources. Abraham was accustomed to taking day trips to Mecca in order to check up on Hagar and his son. And on one of these visits, he takes Ishmael to the sacrifice. Right? Yeah. This is where, you know, where God says, sacrifice your son. Yes. Exactly. So. Now, I've spoken to, look, I've had, I've had extensive discussions with various learned Jews, rabbis as well. And they, they insist, they tell me that what that passage says and means is that God told him, prepare your son for sacrifice. He's not told, sacrifice your son. He's told, make preparations. Go through the preparations for the sacrifice. So there's a distinction that they make within that. That's, that's something they've, they've insisted upon with me. Now, this tradition provides no connection with the pilgrimage or building the Kaaba. So Abraham's presence in Mecca has no connection to pilgrimage or Kaaba, although it connects the sacrifice to Mecca. Mm. Right? Now, the earliest datable mention of Burak is by the poet Ajaj, who died in 715, who mentions it in connection with Abraham in a poem. Poems are normally known as fiction. Precisely. Precisely. Your thoughts, Sam? Yep. No, I, uh, people, you understand who Borak is supposed to be, right? Borak is that animal that Muhammad rode from Mecca to Jerusalem and then throughout the seven heavens. The tradition says Borak was the animal that the prophets would ride on. So understand what he's telling you. How did Abraham end up in Mecca so quickly? Because Burak would transport him from Canaan to Mecca in a nanosecond, like when Solomon used to win, ride the winds. Ride like the wind. Anyway, so that's why it's Burak Airways. But for some reason, Burak's engine shut down, so we don't have Burak Airways anymore after Muhammad. So I just wanted to let them know. That's why it's Burak Airways. But thank you for that. Yeah. So the, so the earliest mention of the Burak is not in the Quran, it's not in the Islamic sources, it's in poetry by a guy who came 100 years after Muhammad. Yep. Right? Yes. 80, 87 years after Muhammad or whatever. And he mentions it not in connection with Momo, but in connection with Abraham. Hmm. Right? So let's have a look here. This is also, by the way, we should mention within the Quran, sorry, within the Hadiths, okay? Mo curses the Jews and the Christians because they built mosques. They built temples on the graves of their prophets. Right? Yes, it does sound like the dragon Saint Demetrius. Now notice, Muhammad curses the Jews and the Christians because they built cave, they built temples on the graves of their prophets. Just so you know, this is where Abraham is buried. And of course, there's a big mosque built over it called the Cave of the Patriarchs. And they have this huge mosque built right on top of it. Because... Because it's a curse upon those people who build mosques and temples on the cave, on the burial place, places of their prophets. Because Islam wouldn't be Islam if it wasn't a bunch of hypocrisy. Yeah, 100%. Right. This is in Hebron, by the way. This is a mosque. They've claimed this cave of the patriarch and they built a mosque over it. And this is something that, of course, Muhammad curses Jews and Christians for. Okay, so Mo is here having a read on the Burak. The illiterate Momo is reading a book on the Burak. Now, notice this looks very Hindu, but that's another story. It's Zoroastrian, okay? Yeah, so The exactly. Burak means lightning. So let's have a look, okay? Let's, let's look at this. So Al-Burak, Burak. Now, you must understand, when you're looking through the sources, you have to look for spelling mistakes and alternatives. Like, for instance, I will give you an example here. I'll give you an example. If you look through all the sources, like the 16, 1700s, and you look for Adija, Okay, you have to look for Khadija, you will have to look for Khadija, you will yep. have to look for Khadija. If you're looking through documents, believe me, it's very laborious. But if you go through 17th and 18th century, 17th century sources, this is the name you'll have to look for. 
a detail. Okay. Now you can miss critical information because you don't know about this. It could also be a misspelling. Okay. It could be like this. It could be, you have no idea. You have to look for any possible variation, but this is a very unusual variation. So you, you can miss stuff if you don't know about these. Okay, so Borak, Al Borak, numerous things. Also, there are misspellings, there's deliberate changes, there's uh, for whatever reasons, right? So the Borak, according to the Islamic narrative, is a mule, elephant, angel, camel, woman, peacock, horse. I am not making this up. Yeah, exactly. You're right. he's, he's not lying to you. This is not a drawing he drew. This would come from Islamic <clears throat> artists, even though Sunnis decry depictions of Muhammad. And the Shia tradition, they're more open to having Muhammad and Ali depicted in drawing. So this is not a Christian drawing. You didn't draw this, did you? Maybe you did. Who knows? I no, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. You know. Okay. So the conveyance of Mo from Mecca to Al Aqsa Mosque and to the skies by means of the Miraj, the ladder, Sulam, is also stated in narrations on the wings. Okay, so basically, so Momo goes to, on the Miraj, so he first goes to Jerusalem, right? The Al-Aqsa Mosque, supposedly. And he goes by means of the Miraj, the ladder, okay? And he does so on the wings of Gabriel in other stories. So in some stories, he goes with the Burak. On other stories, Gabriel carries him. So which one is it? Most of these narrations from Mo himself state he descended from Burak at the Beit al-Naqdis, prayed in the mosque, which historically wasn't built yet, wasn't even there. He prayed in a mosque that had not even been built yet, then ascended to the skies with Gabriel, Gabriel himself, or with two other angels. So hold on, he goes with the Burak, he goes with Gabriel, and he goes with Gabriel and two other angels. Okay? And he brought the Burak on the night of the Isra. So when Mo mounted, the Burak was disobedient, but Gabriel hits the Burak in the face. Because, as you know, Islam is a religion of peace. Pieces, you mean pieces. A piece here, a piece there when they behead you. What's wrong with you? Come on. Re so, so Gabriel, By the way, Lloyd, it wasn't P-E-A-C-E. It was P-I-E-C-E, but it was misspelled. Come on. Practice yeah, what yeah you lots mean. of... So, so basically, so, so according to the Islamic narrative, Gabriel hits the Burak in the face because it didn't want to have Mo on its back and it didn't want to go up to heaven. So Gabriel slaps, punches the thing in the face. That's what you do with your mule, elephant, angel, camel, woman, peacock. Horse. Okay, so Burak will carry Mo on Judgment Day. The Burak transported other prophets as well before Momo. Ibrahim, when he wanted to carry Hajar and Ismail to Mecca, some what? What? So hold on. Abraham took Hagar and Ismail to Mecca on the Burak. They didn't walk. They used Burak Airways. Now. The descriptions of the Burak are conflicting. They're very unclear in the Islamic sources. During ascent, going upwards, its hands became smaller than its feet. And during descent, the feet became smaller than the hands, which keeps the person on its back straight. It is described as a huge mount with a furry mane with a white skin. It has a skin with the best color amongst all the animals. So it's got beautiful, beautiful colors like the rainbow, but it's also white. It's just plain white, except it's got all the colors of the rainbow. Its face was similar to a human's and it could hear and understand like a human. So that's a very clear description. of this. Let's continue. Now, let's look at Islamic mystical literature. Five creatures sit in five trees. The first white sphere, the lion, the Buddha. Hold on. Islamic mystical literature, all of their Gnostics and their mystics talk about the Buddha as a mythical creature. The white falcon, the royal phoenix. And the Buddha comes from the light of Muhammad. Oh, so Muhammad's light not only made all the prophets, made the earth, made the heavens, made the sun. Muhammad's light also created the Buddha. Mm. You know, this is... <clears throat> Amazing. And they speak of Duldul from the light of Ali, the lion from the light of Fatima, the white falcon from the light of Hassan, the royal phoenix from the glittering light of Hussein, and okay, fine, whatever. And then, of course, other Arabic names for Sirius are Al-Abur, the crosser of the galaxy, and Burak or Barrakish, the one of many colors. Didn't we just say it had many colors? Yeah. So one exactly. of the Arabic names for Sirius, the star god of the pantheon of Shin, is the Barak. Are you serious? <laughs> just go. <laughs> I used to be confused, Sam, but now I'm not so sure anymore. That's right, because you took Borak Airways and you had a Slurpee on your way. 
<laughs> so notice Burak has numerous names, okay? So remember there's different spellings, misspellings, Barakish, one of many colors. So then they speak of Jabal al okay? 135 kilometers northeast of Sana. And they speak of the Darb al-Sabi near Barakish. Okay, Barakish, northeast of Sana. So now we've got this Barakish, this name which is linked to Sirius, okay? is now linked in Islam as Arabic names for Sirius. It's linked to the Barak. And of course, Barak is also part of the Yemeni area that I spoke of who worshiped the moon god Sin. And they say here, Barakish. Okay. And the hill is marked by a boundary stone. Nine are preserved. The inscription, boundary of the sanctuary, just like the Meccan Haram. Hmm. Now they're talking about the Kaaba. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So are we seeing connections here? Okay, let's yeah, continue. What a joke. What now, a joke. Yeah. now they go to perhaps Barak El, Barak. Okay, the name is appropriate for the one whose appearance is like that of lightning. See, Enoch, as we all know, Enoch didn't write fiction whatsoever. Also, the Qumran, Book of Giants. Now we talk about Manichaeism and the, the links between Mo and Islam and Manichaeism and in a Gnostic religion are, are very deep. Now, they mention here, look at Jewish law in Manichaean cosmogony, studies in the Book of Giants. So wow. now you've got references to the same Barak or Burak, okay, like that of lightning in Enoch, which is used by Gnostics and Sethian Gnostics and so on, and the Qumran Book of Giants by the Manichaeans. This is a mythical creature. But there's more. This all dates back. They speak here of Metatron, angelic prince of the divine presence, who is the glory of the heavenly heights. There are seven great, beautiful, awesome, wonderfully honored princes. And their names are Michael, Gabriel, and among them, Barak, Barakel. Barak, yeah. Okay, and then they speak of this Enochic fragment. Now, Enoch also is, is regarded as important within Islamic tradition, as one of the people who pass down knowledge to the Muslims, right? And they speak of Enoch here as well. So now, the whole idea of the Barak actually will come to, we'll add a bit more now. So if you go into the Talmud and you look at what the, what the Jewish tradition says, <clears throat> he said, Barak, Barkai, and Akiba said, Allah Barkai, the light has risen. The light has risen. Remember the light of Muhammad, the Barak is the light of Muhammad. It rises up to heaven. That's right. It yeah. has become light even at Hebron, linked to Abraham. The whole east is bright as far as Hebron, right? And then the Mishnah, prayer of Abraham, was when the walls began to be blackened by shadow, said Rabbi Joseph. Do we have to imitate Abraham? And said Rabbi, the Tana learns from Abraham, why shall we not? We should imitate Abraham. So the idea of the Barak, the light has risen, is linked to Abraham. That's why the poetry and the mystical, the mystical allegorical interpretations were all about Abraham and this. And they said, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. Abraham rose up. So do you see that this is all very allegorical, poetical, yeah, it is all mystical. It is not literal. The Muslims now tell us it's real. I want people to see how the rabbis would take every jot and tittle of the Hebrew and pour into it and come up with all these explanations. So you see how they took Genesis 22, 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, Ada, so rise up, morning, light, so rising of the light of Abraham. You see, so they took what was a plain text, and then they <clears throat> brought out a deeper mystical meaning. That's what the rabbis are known for doing with the scriptures. You see that? Amazing how they yeah. did that. Yeah, and of course, the peacock, someone mentioned that the um, there's also the peacock god, which you mentioned before, to do with the Mandaeans, right? So there's that whole, there's a, who's supposed to be potentially Satan as well, the peacock god, the pride. Okay, let's go to the Arda Vira, the night journey with Sarosh. The Arda Vira's Namag, okay? Zoroastrianism has a winged horse-like creature with a human head. In Zoroastrianism, the Arda Viraf made a night Arda Viraf made a night journey to heaven under the guidance of the angel Sarosh in an old Pahlavi book known as the Book of Arda Viraf. The story describes the journey of a saintly priest. Right? This is you can see the pictures here, right? So the story describes the journey of a saintly priest who went into a trance and his spirit went up to the heavens under the guidance of Sarosh. He passed from one utopia to another until he reached the presence of Ormaz, the great deity of the whole universe. When Arda saw the heavens and how happy its inhabitants were, he commanded him to return to earth as his messenger. Who sounds a little familiar to tell the people all that he saw and heard. And Ormaz commanded that his followers pray five times a day. Sam, am I 
Wow. So this, you see now, it's connection to Zoroastrianism, <laughs> the Persian roots of Islam, Zoroastrianism. You guys saw what he just showed you? These are the sources of Zoroastrianism, which was the ancient religion of the Persians before Islam conquered Persia. And here they have a tradition where in English it's, uh, well, they, we call him Zoroaster, but it's Zarathustra, isn't it? That's what his name would be. Zarathustra, yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so you see how he goes on this winged animal creature right. that resembles the Lamaso, the Babylonians. We call that Lamaso, that image you had. In my language, we call it Lamaso. And he goes to see the god, and he's commissioned as a messenger. See the connections? All the pagan connections that shaped and fashioned Islam and Muhammad? Amazing. And here's the bull's horns. Keep that in mind as well, these horns. So in both religions, there's a specified worship of five times a day commanded by Allah. Well, God, Zoroastrianism and Islam share a specified worship in relation to the movement of the sun. Zoroastrians call this specified worship, gah worship or prayer. The term gah means period of time or place. So gah worship means loosely timed worship. So timed worship in Islam as well, five times a day. Let's continue. So the Battle of Badr, I just want to mention, this is a very, look, I'm not saying necessarily that, that anything I tell you is conclusive, but I just want to show you examples, context of how of these ideas throughout history, throughout other similar groups. The Barak, Obama, <clears throat> okay, the Barak lightning flash, the name occurs in Sabayan Barka. Now the Sabayans are the Yemenis, the Yemenis that we started off with. We started with the Ethiopians, who were then worshipping the Yemeni religion. It had been conquered by Yemen. Then we went to Yemen itself, and we'll be coming back to Yemen. But the Sabaeans also happened to have the Burak. In Palmarin Barak and in Punic Barkas, okay, a surname of Hamilkar, and as divine name in Assyrian Raman Birku and Gibil Birku. So notice the name is, there's numerous different variants of the name, but they're all the same name. Barak, so you can see the Barak, Barkai, all of that, it's, it's the same name. Barak was the son of Abinoam of Kadesh, a refuge city in Mount Naphtali. He was summoned by the prophet Deborah to lead his countrymen to war against the Canaanites under the leadership of Sisera. Now, that's an interesting story as well. There's something to do with there. If I ever talk about that in today's, and that's something to look at as well. From the celebrated ode of Deborah, we gathered Israel suffered at the hand of the enemy. The caravan roads were in danger. Traffic almost seized. The cultivated country was plundered. And Barak, accompanied by Deborah, blah, 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 blah. And if you look at this, under the heavy rainfall, the alluvial plain became a morass in which the heavy armed troops found it impossible to move, and Barak eventually killed them in his tent. Now, there are certain parallels here with the idea of the Battle of Badr. Even the word Badr has a particular meaning, so that's... But just thought I'd mention that. Did you pick up anything from this? Or, but there's just a point of interest here. So. Someone was asking about the Zoroastrian religion, so I just want to comment. I, I don't know. Sure. I know uh, we were not always sanctified. You guys know Freddie Mercury of the band Queen? Mm -hmm. Freddie Mercury? Freddie Mercury was a Zoroastrian. There are still people who claim mm -hmm. to be Zoroastrians. So for those There's of you who are... 400,000 in the world. Yeah, say to how many? 400,000. I used to know one. Yeah. See? And Freddie Mercury is perhaps the most famous Zoroastrian. So there are people who still follow the Zoroastrian religion because that was the ancient religion of Persia, Freddie Mercury of Queen, the most famous, I would say, Zoroastrian, because he's a rock singer anyway. Yeah, they're still around. Go ahead, brother. I just want to make right. that clarification. Okay, so <clears throat> Abraham built the Kaaba. So narrated Abu Dhar, I said, O Allah's messenger, which mosque was built first? He replied, the al mashid ul Haram. I asked, which was built next? He replied, al mashid ul Aqsa, Jerusalem. Okay, so the Kaaba was built first, and then Jerusalem. I asked, what was the peri period in between these two mosques? And he replied, 40 years. This is in the Da'if Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 55, Hadith 636. Remember, Da'if Bukhari. because it... Let's have a look. This is where the Christian era begins. All right. King Solomon builds the Temple of Jerusalem in approximately 957 BC. Right. According to the 7th century Muhammad, the Kaaba is 40 years older built 997 BC. Now, this is false because Abraham was born around 1800 BC and died 1625 BC. Now, now here's the thing. Weren't we just told by the Muslims that Abraham either built or rebuilt the Kaaba 
But now we've got Momo himself telling us that this building was built 40 years prior to the temple of King Solomon in Jerusalem. So this guy just told us here, I don't want to call Momo a liar, but they were just telling us that he built it or maybe Abraham Adam built it or he rebuilt it or something. But Sam, does this make any sense? See, this is your problem again. You're trusting extra Quranic historical sources and archaeological inscriptions, not realizing they're all corrupt. Everything is corrupt. Even your face and my face are corrupt. Only Islamic sources are true. Who told you Abraham lived at that time? If Muhammad said the temple was built 40 years before the Temple of Solomon, then that means Abraham did not live according to your information, 1800 BC. When are you going to get with the program before I get Burak to take you away? Okay, man. So, you know what? Mo was a time traveler. Hold on. I'm, I'm getting it now. I'm, I'm hearing yes. the voices. That's what happens when you go to Iraq to drink some Slurpees. What's wrong with you? Great. So, so, so yeah. I mean, do you understand that this this story, the whole story of Abraham in Islam, makes absolutely no sense. If we had to sit down and properly prepare the history of Abraham and Mecca, Islam would have nothing to defend themselves on this because the story of Abraham tears Islam apart. Let's continue. <clears throat> okay. So, a couple of resources. You can see these tough seeds, okay, 1437. And then, of course, Harold Motzke wrote an interesting book, um, Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael at Mecca, A Contribution to the Problem of Dating Muslim Traditions, Journeys in Holy Lands, The Evolution of the Abraham-Ishmael Legends in Islamic Exegesis, Reuben Firestone. Then History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria by G. Maspero. And um, all of my resources, as you all know, are available. So everything that I have is available here in my Google Archive, okay? I will, in fact, drop that archive link now in the chat so that we... Uh, box too. <clears throat> put in the description box. So when you do that. So I've just dropped that in there. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to drop this link in again a couple of times. That's my link to my archive. Everything you need will be here. Also, I want to mention, I'm going to drop this link in as well. This is my OneDrive link. Okay, this is my OneNote link. I have numerous articles here. Right, which I've written, lots of details, things I've collected, the things I've written. So for instance, just as an example, so if you want to find some information, you can do a search here, right? But <clears throat> besides that, there's this common claim that Christianity was invented by Paul. As you can see here, I have this very lengthy series of articles discussing the overlap between what Paul says and what Jesus says, how they are completely corroborated. Right, that Paul nowhere contradicts or conflicts with the with the discussions within the New Testament, and I'll talk about the origin of much of. The, well, I'll have you do that series here when yeah. you finish the series. Yeah. We'll get you to do that as well, God willing. Yeah. So, so that was just an example. I wasn't. Yeah. So I've got loads of things here. So there's loads of stuff that I have here, um, talking about you know. So we can talk about, for instance, the covenant of Noah. I've got loads of things. If you want to have a look at that, I will drop that link shortly. Okay. So now again. Um, yeah, so let me skip that, move on. Okay, moving on here. Right, let's look at old maps. So Sam, any comments or questions so far? I'm going to move on to a new section, old maps. Well, it's phenomenal so far, and people are seeing. The only miracle of Islam is that people think the Quran is miraculous. You really have to be ignorant of the Muslim sources, or you have to be pretty much intellectually challenged to continue to believe this. This is pure garbage, but may the Lord Jesus have mercy on these Muslims. And they see the light of Christ, not of Muhammad. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to drop that link in the chat quickly, and then I'm going to... Um, this is my one, my one note. You'll see Islam shared. I've just dropped that. Okay, let me move on. Okay, now we're going to talk about old maps, right? So old maps were not yet googlified, right? For those people who were born in the modern era, Google wasn't always around, huh. okay? Now, different maps used different coordinate systems. They had different accuracy, they had different measurements. Now, notice down here, we've got Ethiopia sub Egypto. Anything south of Ethiopia was just, so basically anything south of Egypt was just called Ethiopia because that was the extent of their knowledge, right? Now, notice here where Mecca is, where Makkah is, it says here, Sabai, the Sabaeans, right? And then up here in the north, Close towards, as you get towards Petra, Arabia Deserta, you have Saraceni, the Saracens. This would be 
the destitute of Sarah. Right? I discussed that in the previous one. So Sam notes up here on this old map. This is a this is a 15th century map of Arabia, approximately 1478. Obviously based on earlier maps. You can see the inaccuracy of the map here. Notice here next to Mecca, where Mecca should be, you've got something called Sebei, the Sebaeans. It says the Sebaeans are here, and then the Saracens are up here. Any thoughts on that before I continue, Sam? Yes, I want you guys to see how it's going to converge. If you remember in the previous sessions who the Sabaeans were, Saba, they're the ones that worshipped the moon, stars. They had eventually seven prayers, went down to five prayers. It's going to connect with Islam and moon worship. So follow the flow. See how it all converges. I just want to remind them of the previous session because you brought this up about the Sabians from Saba and so on yep. and so forth. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Makaraba. So Muslims like to claim, well, you know, Mecca was discussed actually as early as the second century. It was called Makaraba. Did you know that? Did you know that? Alhamdulillah. Alhamd to Allah. Take <laughs> beer. Which beer? Not. <laughs> we all know which beer we don't drink anymore, right? Anything from Budweiser. We don't touch that stuff. Yeah. That's that, that's that, that's a tranny fluid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I used to be hesitant drinking Corona because of the virus, but now no more Budweiser. That's why it's Michelob all day. Okay. So now Ptolemy in his geography calls Makaraba at 73 degrees, 20 minutes, 22 seconds. Okay. that That's all the detail we have for this place, which is not really enough to, to nail it down. Okay. Now Makaraba or Makaraba, according to Ptolemy, it is a city in Northwestern Arabia, Felix, happy Arabia. Arabia deserta is southern Syria to the northern Hejaz, right? That's the northern section where we saw Saraceni. Arabia Felix is the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, which includes incense producing Yemen, Oman, southern Saudi Arabia, including Najran. Now, what mm -hmm. that means is that this area that they are referring to as Happy Arabia, where Ptolemy claims that, that Makaraba is, the Makaraba he claims is down here, he claims it's this section. He doesn't claim it's the Hejaz. Ptolemy was talking about this area, the south, much further south than Mecca. Okay. So now, Claudius Ptolemy's second century geography places the name Makkoraba in the west of the Arabian Peninsula. And with the lack of historical evidence for Makkah, apologists claim that it is exactly. Mecca. Now, Ptolemaeus Claudius, or Ptolemy, lived from roughly nine, the year 90 to the year 168 AD. He was a Greek writer. He wrote the guide to drawing the earth, which listed latitude and longitude for cities, mountains, and other geographical features known Amazing. in his day. Amazing. Now, Amazing. for more information, see Dan Gibson, the location of Mecca in Ptolemy's geography, and Ian D. Morris, Mecca and Makaraba. Uh, those papers are in my folder. You will find them. Okay? Just search for that. Can I ask you a now, there's mention of Makoraba, but I really want to know this because it's been killing me. Any mention of the Makorina? Hey, Makorina. <laughs> I, just you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we just need to look. I mean, because okay, as, we know, as we know, Muhammad probably invented that first. I got it. So, so, okay, now, now let's have a look here about this word Makoraba. And this is going to be important as well. They say a myriad sources include, of course, Ptolemy in a chapter arguing that Kush was the ancestor of the Saracens. Now that's very interesting, okay? Kush, now this is Aksum here. Kush would be approximately this region just north of Ethiopia, right? This would be the area just north of Ethiopia. And they're saying here that, that Kush, this area, okay, was the ancestor of the Saracens, the Saracens being these guys, okay? Saraceni, the Saracens, the destiny of Sarah, right? Okay, fine, that's one academic discussion. But this guy called Bohart, this guy gives an account of Arabian geography. He correctly identified the location of the Hejaz. The Hejaz is this area here. Okay, this is the Hejaz here, right? Mecca, Medina. So he, so this man called Bahar correctly identifies the location of the Hejaz and he names some of the towns in the area, including Mecca, which Bahar claims in Ptolemy is Makoraba. Okay, and he says Mecca Raba or Great Mecca. Now this... This mention of Mecca as Makoraba, this is the first recorded instance where Makoraba has been identified with Mecca, where this man, Bahar, makes the claim. And he says it's Mecca, or Great Mecca. 
So this is the first time that this has been mentioned in history where Makaraba is identified with Mecca. Fascinating. First wow. identification of Makaraba as Mecca is traced to Samuel Bohart in Sacred Geography in 1646. Wow. Ptolemy never made the claim. So this man in the 17th century AD, 1646, he's the one who tried to connect Makaraba with Mecca. So then that means we're going to connect Makarina with Medina. See Makarina, Medina. So there's your connection. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. So no satisfactory derivation has been proposed to explain the difference between the two names. It, it doesn't mix. They don't match. The word is based on the southern Semitic root Mukarb, M-K-R-B. Hold on, Mukarb. You might remember early in the first episode, we discussed the Mukarbs who come from here. The Mukarbs. Okay, and we're going to be talking about those again quite from Yemen, meaning temple, sanctuary, but also altar. And these guys, the temples that they had were, were those of the moon god Sin. Now, Bohart used the root Makat Rabah for Great Mecca. However, this is incorrect for the Arabic language. These are not the right roots for Arabic. So he made a mistake. And Muslims and everyone else have pounced on this mistake as evidence. This is not a second century claim. This is a 1646 claim and a mistake on top of it yep. with Same no thing. evidence to back it up. So now this is Diction of Arabic and Allied Loanwords. Okay. Apparently an abridgment of Sarasan Mukarab sanctuary from the Gez Mukarab or Mekrab, the Gez, the Gez Mekrab to judge from the Latin form of Makoraba. So what, what we have is the term Mekrab Okay, Mukarib, Mukarib is just, and so Makaraba is just the Latinization of Mukarib, the Yemeni Mukarib, okay, in Claudio Ptolemeo, okay, so we've got that from this particular source here, amongst others. So Makaraba, the Karib, to Al Mahabisha, Yemen. Now, adjusting Ptolemy's coordinates will correctly place the towns and rivers in South Arabia on a modern map. However, towns previously cited as locations of Makkah are all now discovered to be located elsewhere. Huh. Here, Ptolemy's original locations overlaid on a modern map, and Mecca and Makoraba are marked in red. Okay? So this is Mecca here. This is modern Mecca. This is Makoraba. Huh. Okay? Ptolemy's... Are, he, this is all far off. Notice that some of these towns are in the ocean. This is when you adjust Ptolemy's coordinate system to modern coordinates to match them. Notice all of these things go all over the place. They spread out north and south, move randomly around sometimes, and many of them end up in the ocean. Clearly, the coordinates, the further you got away from Ptolemy's Greece, the longer, the, the, the worse the coordinates get, and the more these things just end up in random spots. Thank you, mm. Catholic publicist. Appreciate it. Yeah, so, okay. So now, of course, we can see that if these are in the ocean, then everything is wrong. Nothing here can be relied upon. Let's continue. Now, we all know there are no Meccan archaeological artifacts until the 8th century AD or later. Right? The first mention of Makkah is the Byzantine Arab Chronicle in 741 AD, placing Makkah in Mesopotamia. Oh, wow. Mm. Mecca's in Mesopotamia. That would be around here. Fascinating. Okay, great. Great stuff. Moving on. The first time Mecca is listed on a map of the Middle East is apparently 900 AD. Not the second century. Mecca, the mother of cities, according to Quran 692 and 427, did not exist in the early 7th century. I think that is very clear. We, we've known yeah. this for a long time now. Yeah. Makoraba, however, is located 720 kilometers south of Makkah because we know where Makoraba is. We have been able to establish where Makoraba is. This is Makoraba. It is here at Al-Mahabisha. Oh. Of Mahabisha. And notice, remember what I what is the closest town to this location? Haran, which is Haran, name huh? of, which shares the name with Haran in Turkey. I see. So mm. This is 720 kilometers south of Mecca. Now notice, doesn't the Quran and don't the Islamic sources speak of how lush and mountainous and green Mecca was with all the fruits and the dates? Well, here's the landscape at the Al-Mahabisha. So that fits the description of the Quran, not Mecca. Correct. Now, scholars have long said, like even Gibson has long said, well, you know, I think it's Petra. And I've been to Petra. I spent a couple of days in Petra. Like I spent two and a half days in Petra, right? I, I went around the time. I even went to the well that Matt Dan Gibson speaks of and all that. So I spent time there in Jordan. 
And there are two places, two places that match the descriptions in the Quran and the Islamic sources of Mecca. One, Petra, fine. And another, which has even better fits the description, is Al Mahabisha in Yemen. Mm. Mm. So it's very, it's very easy. The greenery and everything fits the description of the Quran. Yes. Amazing. The caves, the mountains, the greenery, the valleys. Yes. This fits the description of the Quran. Yes, it does. Okay, mm -hmm. moving on. I, I usually would go to some other pictures, but I'll skip that now. Um, okay, Ptolemy's map. Now, let's look at Ptolemy's map and let's see how accurate this is. So, guys, how long should I go on for, Sam? It's up to you. It's your time. Yeah. <clears throat> so, of course, of course, there, there, are, there are Muslim scholars that say, well, you know, according to this scholar, uh, Mecca used to have a very lush environment. In fact, it was more like a tropical jungle. And then, due to climate change, it actually became very dry. But just 500 years ago, Mecca was actually more like the kind of jungle you'd see Conan the Barbarian striding through, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, I've well, seen yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Petra. It's hot, it's sand, it's dry. Yeah, I, I don't know whether I, I miss the vegetation, the lush vegetation, the bananas and the pineapples. I definitely didn't see those when I was there due to climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Allah took up the original <clears throat> Petra, and it's in Jannah now. That's the reward of the believers. You will see it in Jannah. It's no longer on earth. But that's you, your skepticism. Shh. I'm getting tired of you being skeptical, man. Yep. So, uh, okay, so moving on. So this is a mid-15th century Florentine world map based on the first modified conic projection in Jacobus. Actually, we should call him James. <laughs> Exactly. In, in James Angelus's 1406 Latin translation of Maximus Planudi's late 13th century rediscovered Greek manuscripts of Ptolemy's second century geography. Mm. It's a hand-me-down of a hand-me-down of a hand-me-down of a hand-me-down. <laughs> now, Serica <laughs> is shown in the far northeast of the world. That is Parthia. Okay, that's up here. Parthia. Parthia is important because that's the... Parthia became the Sasanian Empire, was the Zoroastrian Empire, became the Persian Empire, became the Iranians. Oddly enough, it features here, and that's actually very important for heresy and Gnosticism. It's actually very, very important. The fact that it's there means that it was known, means that it had a role that early on. So, yes, it's relevant. Mm. Notice terra incognita to the south. So, basically, anything below Egypt is like, who knows? Okay, this is the map. Let's have a look. Let's compare. This is a close-up of Arabia. Right. This is a close-up of Arabia. You can see Italy. That looks exactly like Italy right there. Yep, that looks for sure like Italy. Definitely could uh, could find my way there if I was flying Burak Airways. <laughs> this is born in Italy here. <clears throat> this is Italy here. Okay, this Sicily you can see. And eventually we'll start to see the, the coastlines now. Let's have a look at the coastlines. This is Arabia. Let's compare. This is modern Arabia at the ocean. You can see these dimensions and these shapes are completely off. Right? So in terms of placing any city or town accurately, the further south you go, the worse the deviation gets. Right? Now, let's continue. This is, a, this is a printed, this is a 1582 map. A printed, so 1482 from the 15th century depicting Ptolemy's description of the Ecumen or the known inhabited world. This is 1482. This is not exactly what we'd call accurate. Hmm. Right, <clears throat> you can see Arabia again, not exactly accurate. Let's continue. So, those are maps. Maps were very bad. So, to claim that Makkah Makka and Makaraba, no. but we'll come back to that's actually very important. We'll be discussing that. So, Saba, the Sabaioi, the Sabai, the Bible, right? The Sabai or Sabaioi or the Latin Sabai, there are people in the ancient kingdom known from local inscription as Saba, 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 also Sheba. Situated in southwestern Yemen. Saba is attested in Assyrian sources. So that's probably your granddad wrote about them, Sam. Mm. Mm. Now, there are, for instance, in the annals of the Tig Tiglath Pileser III, to whom the Saba Aja paid homage with gifts in about 730 BC. The Saba are known to go back to the previous millennium at least. The annals of Saga on the second, where in 715 the Sabaean Itamra is mentioned as bringing tribute. In an inscription of Sennacherib, hmm, sounds biblical, according yeah. to which in 685, Karib Eli, Karib Eli, Karib El, the Karib of El, El was the Canaanite god. 
the ones who worship the Canaanite El, okay, Karib, well, this word Karib, we'll, we'll be talking about that more. He sends gifts. Now, Sennacherib, in the, the Brill book here, Sennacherib, yep. the moon god Sin, Sennacherib, the moon uh, god Sin has replaced the brothers. Wow, that's what it means. Huh? So, Sin, Acherib, Sanchirub, Sin, the moon god. These are, by the way, these are my, who's telling you, I'm Assyrian, physical descendant of the Assyrian em Empire. So, it's interesting that my, one of my ancestral kings, Sin is part of his name, the moon god, just like uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebo was also a Babylonian god. Interesting. Sanchirub. Yeah. Sin. <clears throat> so. So now, basically, his, his brothers died or something. There was an accident. To, to his brothers died or something, and he was born, and he replaced the brothers. So God gave them, their God gave them a new son, right? So he is obviously linked to Babylon, Nineveh, okay? And let's continue, right? So the kingdom fell after civil war between, between several Yemenite dynasties claiming kingship, and they split into separate territories. The Himerite kingdom, the Himerite kingdom arose as victors. Okay, the Himerites were roughly, let's have a look here. Himerites are roughly sort of here in the middle, somewhere around here. But basically, it's all Yemen. Okay, it's all like same, same. They are traders. They are mentioned in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel and in Job 1.15. They are described as a rival nation of Israel. In fact, they hate the Israelis. They hate the Jews due to their religious differences. These are, these are antithetical religious differences. Isaiah 45, 14 describes them as a people of great physique. In Job 1, 12, 15, we see that the Sabaeans are used by Satan to attack. Satan heard that name somewhere before. Exactly. Used by Satan to attack and enslave Job's family after killing their servants. And he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of God. There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and only I am escaped to tell them. Wow, thank you, guys. I appreciate that. That's really kind. So they're very so, ancient. They're even found all the way at the time of Job. And Job is believed to be one of the oldest books and well attested in the Bible. And unlike the Quran, archaeological inscriptions confirm the Bible. You see how archaeological sources are confirming the biblical history narrative, unlike the Quran, the Quran. Beautiful. Yeah, and we are going to tie all of this back to the moon. This is so I'm putting that again, I'm putting down all these different threads. Is this making sense so far? Is it logical? Is it? Of course, man. It's beautiful. It's converging. That's what I'm saying. You're bringing all these different groups throughout this region and the lines of evidence converge to one conclusion moon worship astral worship was predominant the predominant worship in these civilizations they were astral <clears throat> religions meaning they worship sun moon stars and you see how prevalent moon worship was throughout this region thereby proving that in Arabia, the dominant deity was the moon. You see what he's where he's leading you guys? It's all going to converge. Follow the trail, right? Yeah. But it has nothing to do with Islam. Keep that. No, up. no, nothing. nothing. No. It has but everything I, to do with level 11 and Slurpee, but nothing to do with Islam. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully, sure. I'm not just giving you fluff for the sake of fluff. Hopefully, I'm saying, look, this is context. These are the, these are the players on the map. This is the map. We just looked at the map. Then we're going to look at the words. We're looking at the geography. We're looking at the people. All of these influences. And we will start to see all of this converge and connect. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So now... <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Otto Christos. Okay. So now these Sabaeans are enemies of God. They're used by Satan. They are the, they are the hand of Satan against God's people. So the Sabaeans are believed to be Muslims. This is according to, and we opened up with this in episode one, to Muhammad Shukri al Alusi, who compares the Islamic religion to that of the Sabaeans. In his writings, Muhammad compares the two beliefs, and they are similar in most practices. And the Sabaeans were practitioners of many elements of the religion of Abraham. Right? 
which was moon worship, paganism. So what's in a name? This is from Biblical Archaeology Review. Um, my, my subscription to these guys has expired. There's actually some really useful. These guys stay on top of the latest archaeology. It's very useful. Now notice here, it says here, Shin is the god Shin, brothers. Okay. Senachereba, the replaced. Okay. The deity Shin is also known as Nana in Sumerian. Now I mentioned this deity would change, would swap genders. He was gender fluid or she was gender fluid, but also would change names, right? And also sometimes when they said, look, we've got we've got the god Botox and these guys are following the god Lamb Chops. It doesn't yeah. mean those two different gods. It's just that the one guy's like Lamb Chops. So they like, they call their god the god of Lamb Chops, but it's the same god. And the other I, guy's like Botox. So it, it was the same god, different name. I, I, different I just, I, did I catch you? Did I hear you correctly? Nana? Nana, yes. So like Nana, like grandma or like na 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 By the way, Lloyd, I don't know if you know this. I'm sure you do. Not that you don't. In the Hadiths, they called Muhammad a Sabi, a Sabian. Yes, yes. I will get to that as well. Yes. I know, see, I know Muhammad you. Muhammad know. the Sabi. Yeah. I follow Nana. Na, na, na. Okay, Lloyd? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'll we'll see. get to that. Muhammad the Sabi. Exactly. Muhammad is called the Sabi. And the man who founded a new religion. So the deity Shin, or Nana in Severan, is the Mesopotamian god of the moon and wisdom of the Hikama. First mentioned in writing in about 3500 BC. Shin is amongst the most ancient and prominent deities attested in human history. Yes, they had transgender gods back then. Right, moving on. So I want to establish this was moon god worship. Every single source attests that this is moon god worship north and south, and in fact, the same religion from the bottom to the top, right? From the north to the south was the same religion. The words might differ. The names might differ. It's the same religion. Now, Sabaean historical context. Sabaeans carried out trade by land and by sea, leading to massive growth from the 18th century BC onwards. They established colonies along the Red Sea and in Ethiopia. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, Hope. That's great. Okay, so let's continue. Now, they had extremely lucrative spice trade, especially frankincense and myrrh. The Sabaeans lived in the land of Sheba as regional monarchies. The first king was Kharab al Bayan. Okay, now this also would link to the term Bayan Bay in Islam, but that's okay. The Kharab, the Muqarib, the Muqarib. Mu is a prefix meaning one who does what follows next, right? Muqarib. Makaribba, Mukaribba, yeah. ruling during 700 to 800 BC, and the Karabel. This is this is linked to the Karab El. El is the Canaanite main Hi. deity. That's right. Right. Karab, yep. Karab. These words will come in. Karab, Karab, Karab. Constantly rocks up. Karibi Ilu was a Mukarib of Saba who reigned from 700 to 680 BC. The name Karibi Ilu in Akkadian matches Karab Al Bayan in Sabaean. So now we've got, hold on, Akkadian, Canaanite, Sabaean, North, South, all the same. See? Same God, same religion. We're starting to see connections here. It's combined of Karab El, which means one who carries out the instructions of El, and Bayan, one who removes punishment. Mm. Right? Mm. One who removes mm. punishment. Karab El, one, Mu, and then Mu Karab is one who does the one who, a Muslim is one who does Salim, right? Submission or whatever it is today. So the best known, they are best known in context of the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, right? That, that's the best known context of the Sabaeans, the Queen of Sheba. Various writers have cited this narrative, the Assyrians, the Greeks, and the Romans in the 8th century. And Saba, that's BC. And Saba is mentioned twice in Quran 27 and Quran 34. And as people of Tubba, Kalm Tubba in Quran 44 and Quran 50. Now, <clears throat> let's look at some words. Mikrab, mikrab, makoraba. So let's look at the what. What is makoraba? Mikrab, plural, maharib. The prayer niche in the mosque, indicating the direction of prayer, is made up of an arch, right? The arch, the supporting columns and capitals, and the space between them, where in a flat or recessed form, it gives the impression of a door or a doorway. Now, remember, we opened the very first episode with pillars as a doorway, a false doorway, separating the profane from the sacred as you enter into the pagan temple of worship, right? So the Kaaba, outside the sin, the standard Islamic narrative, nothing is known of its history. 
The only reason for presuming the Kaaba was in existence in the 2nd century AD is the mention of Mecca as Makaraba by Ptolemy. Now, this is a quote from the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 4, except we've just seen the previous slide on Bokhart, where it doesn't come from the 2nd century. That is a mistake made by Bokhart in 1646. Yeah. It shows you that even scholars of high standing and encyclopedias can get it wrong. Yep, exactly. Now, in a, in a concise Encyclopedia of Islam by Parander, little is known of the history of the Kaaba outside Islamic tradition, but there is reason to believe the shrine was an active pilgrimage site as early as the second century. The geographer Ptolemy calls the city Makoraba with the significance of Mekrab or temple. Hold on. So he's wrong. We know he's wrong about the second century, but Ptolemy, apparently the context in which he talked of Makoraba was with the word Mekrab. The word the Mekrab. <clears throat> right? Can I hammer this point you're saying? I just want you guys to understand what he's saying. You have Ptolemy in the second century. Make the connection. Bro. This is how scholarship works. This is why you cannot elevate, idolize, or deify scholarship. Understand this point. This point is gold. In Jesus' name, I pray we remember this. Please, brethren, this is a class. You're getting seminary stuff. So I got to pray for him. Go to his channel, support him, and as well as support him financially, do this work for the glory of Christ. What you have in these scholars is they took Ptolemy's statement, a reference in the second century to Makaraba. And on the basis of the misinformation, misinterpretation of Bakhar in 1647 AD, 17th century, where he, in the 17th century, connected Ptolemy's Makaraba with Mecca. So these scholars blindly parroted what a 17th century author said about Ptolemy's reference to Makaraba. If you compare the coordinates given by Ptolemy, Makaraba cannot be Mecca. So why do they keep identifying Mecca? Because of the 17th century, 1646, 1647 reference, where this author, Bakhar, said that this means Mecca, and all the scholars parroted that mistake. This is how scholarship works. They take a statement, one scholar, and they keep parroting it until some uh, someone else comes and then challenges it. And then changes the view of scholarship. So I just want them to understand that point. Mm. So Makuraba has the significance of Mikrab, temple, Mikrab. And we've now noticed that the Mukarabs, Makuraba, we know it's the Latinization. Makuraba is the Latinization of Mukarab. The Mukarabs are the Sabaeans, the worshippers of the moon god Sin. Right? So now we're starting to connect. And this is our weak academia, academia is exactly. So Mecca is known to the ancient geographers as Makoraba and to the Arabs as Makka. Okay. The name Makoraba means temple in various Semitic languages. This is this probably referred to the Kaaba. Okay, according to various sources. I mean, so this probably refers to the Kaaba. We know it means temple in various Semitic languages. So a scholar called Glazer believes this name may have signified the same as South Arabian or Ethiopian Mikrab or temple. So we knew that the Ethiopians of the time were worshippers of the moon god Sin. They worshipped the same religion as the Yemenis, right? The, Ma the Muqarabs, Makaraba Muqarabs. Now in modern Islamic usage, Mikrab means pranish. So <clears throat> here are the columns, and we've mentioned these fake columns, okay? In front of the, um, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, we showed that, and this was identified with pagan worship. Alexa. Stop. For some reason, Alexa started talking to me. Okay. Notice the propylon at the faux entrance. This is a common feature of mikrabs. Okay. So we've got similar symbolism to what we showed with the worshippers of sin. Okay. So let's look at Abraha in Mecca. So aside from Muslim traditions, practically nothing is known of the history of the Kaaba. Right. So they've mentioned Mecca and the Makaraba. Okay. We know that. Now, the account of the campaign of Abraha, which have been elaborated with legendary features. So we know Abraha was a real individual. He left from yes. Ethiopia, went across, okay, with his army. And we know he was real. He was a Christian, so which have been elaborated with legendary features. They've obviously added myth, you know, and legend to it. Also suggests the existence and worship of the Kaaba in the 6th century, but it tells us nothing of its appearance or its equipment. So there must have been a Kaaba. This doesn't mean it was the one in Mecca. We know that we can identify Makoraba 
and the temples with Ethi with Yemen, right? We we know we can identify major temples here. Okay. Notice here is Barak Ish. Barak Ish. We just mentioned the Burak, Barak Ish, which is just like what's in Mecca. Remember, there was the reference to this is just like what's in Mecca today. We know that there were major temples to sin here, and there was a major temple here at Haran al Mahabisha, right? So now we know that Makoraba is here. This is the location of Makoraba. And so we know that there was a Kaaba. We know that he attacked supposedly a Kaaba, but clearly not the one in Arabia today. Mm. Okay, let's continue. Abraha is also spelled Abreha, 6th century AD, Ethiopian Christian viceroy of Saba, Yemen, in southern Arabia. He was a zealous Christian himself. He's said to have built a great church at Sana, okay, al Kules from the Greek Ecclesia, to compete with the Kaaba at Mecca. We also know there was nothing at Mecca back in the day, but we know that the big temple apparently could well have been here, mm. Makoraba. Okay, there were some large temples here. We've got Barak Isha, Barak, the Burak Airways. The airport was here for Burak Airways. Now, he repaired the principal ir irrigation dam at the Sabaean capital of Marib. Abrah is famous, however, for the military expedition that he led northward against the city of Mecca in a supposedly the same year as Muhammad's birth, about 570. It was supported by elephants, apparently, but the expedition failed, and the Muslims believe that Mecca escaped capture only through a miracle. Abraha's rule ended in 575, when the Persian Sasanians invaded the region and brought the Sabaean kingdom to an end. Hmm. Outside of later Islamic tradition, there is no mention of Abraha's expedition, including from Abraha's own inscriptions. So that's probably all myth. We'll talk about that now. African war elephants had not been used in the region for over 600 years, according to Daniel Beck in his book. I've got the book. I can show, I can bring it up and show it, but whatever. It is also difficult to explain how Abraha would have gotten a hold of African elephants in Arabia. And Quran 105 appears to be appealing to traditions from the book of Maccabees and not referencing any actual event on Abraha's part. Let any me, comment before I move on? Yeah, let me expound on what he's saying here, brethren. Brethren, uh, let me explain what he's trying to tell you. So, because again... You have to be familiar with Islam. Many of you are, many of you may not know. In chapter 105 of the Quran, according to the commentators, this talks about Abraha, who's an actual historical finger, a king who is a devoted Christian, who actually worshipped the triune God. According to Islamic tradition, interpreting Surah 105, pay attention to what he's trying to tell you. Because, see, I, I understand the background of Islam because I've been doing it for 20 years. Some of you may not know what he's talking about. According to the Muslim exposition of chapter 105 of the Quran, <clears throat> Abraha traveled to Mecca to destroy and demolish the Kaaba. Why? Because the tradition says one of the pagans went to the church he built and pretty much dishonored it by defecating in it. So when Abraha Abraham found out, he supposedly took elephants. This is these <clears throat> Story in one, chapter 105, elaborated in Muslim tradition. And then supposedly some birds came and pelted them with <clears throat> stones. So Allah miraculously intervened by causing birds to pelt <clears throat> Abraham and his army with elephants, with stones. And then he wasn't able to demolish the Kaaba. But you hear what he just said? There were no elephants in use for, you said, 600 years, right? Apparently so, yeah. Okay, did you hear what he's saying? In that region, they didn't have elephants. That region had no war elephants for 600 years. So where in the world did the Muslim sources get that Abraha, Abraha brought war elephants? And then on top of that, how much gallons of water would they need to have elephants traversing desert to get to the Kaaba to demolish it? So this is nonsense, baloney, Bull shat from the pit of hell. Just wanted to clarify that. Go ahead, brother. I'm just going to find the book by Beck. I've got it somewhere. Okay, so moving on. Let's continue. Right, now, Al-Bedawi. It is reported that the battle of the elephant. Now, now here's the story from the Muslim side. A strong elephant named Mahmoud. So this Christian, this Christian, this very devout Ethiopian Christian, had an elephant named Mahmoud. The lead elephant of the elephants of war that he took 
was called Mahmoud. Uh, Mahmoud's a diminutive of Bill is a diminutive of the name William. Yeah, uh, uh, it's uh, the of Tony. Tony, right? Uh, ja Muhammad. Mahmoud is a, the elephant. Is, are you say, Sam? Was the elephant called Muhammad? Last time I checked, Mahmoud has no connection with Tony, but Mahmoud, Ahmed, Muhammad, they all come from the same root. Mahmoud, Muhammad, Ahmed. So there was an elephant named Muhammad. So Muhammad was the elephant of Allah. Yes. Nothing to do with Islam. Do with Islam. Allah works in mysterious ways, Sam. Allah like works in mysterious like ways. So... So Abraha had an elephant named Mahmoud and another she elephant. There were two elephants. However, you know, when he mobilized his army, the elephant arrived. And whenever they pointed Mahmoud towards Mecca, the elephant Mahmoud would kneel down and just stay there. When they pointed the elephant Mahmoud away from Mecca, away from the Muhammad, the baby, the child in the cradle in Mecca, the elephant would be happy to go. But when they pointed Mahmoud at Mecca, the elephant would just kneel down and stop. Hmm. So I already anticipated you were going to say this. I forgot. I'm sorry for intervening because you mentioned the story. Now, one thing I need clarification. The elephant's name was Mahmoud, and there was a she-elephant? Yeah. Now, by any chance, was that she-elephant name Khadija? Because if it's I Khadija... I no idea, actually. I need to check, actually. Because Khadija sounds like Khadija. Maybe... Mahmoud and Khadija, the male and female elephants, are the precursor to Muhammad and Khadija. Nothing to do Who knows? Who, I don't know. This, this just... Okay, so now we go to Qurtubi. Okay? So Qurtubi's comment on this is representative in presenting sources that equate the year of the elephant with that of Muhammad's birth. So Qurtubi is representative of all the Muslim sources that equate the year of the elephant with that of Muhammad's birth, as well as those that place Abraha's attack 23 or 40 years earlier. Oh, that's interesting. So Noldeke, Lamens, and Blacher pointed out the inconsistencies within the early Arabic sources and the contradictions between them. Because according to the Muslim sources, the attack by Abraha could have happened 23 years or as many as 40 years before 570. Hmm. That puts it at 530 as early as 530. That's 40 years before the Arabic, the standard Islamic narrative. So you're saying, so people get it, that according to the Muslim sources, when Abraha attacked Mecca, that was the year Muhammad was born? Yes. Or then, it could have been as much as 23 years before. Or 40 that's, years so, before. that's what I'm saying. So if the Muslim sources are right, Muhammad was born at the time of Abraha's attack, and yet the extra Quranic sources confirm that the attack took place way earlier, that means even the alleged birth date of Muhammad is wrong? Yes, by as much as 40 years according to this chronology. As much as 40 oh, years. May he may have been born 530, so that means we cannot trust the Muslim chronology because it sucks, it's from the pit of hell, but nothing to do with Islam. Nope, nope, remember that. Okay, so hopefully I am proving, hopefully to the audience, I mean, one, I hope I'm being logical, sensible, rational, detailed, and yep. I'm presenting strong evidence. I'm, I'm showing things that are relevant. And hopefully you are convinced. And I've proved that this has nothing to do with Islam. Exactly. By the end of this, we, we want to prove definitively beyond doubt that this has nothing to do with Islam. Exactly. Okay, exactly. let's continue. According to some of the histories, when the people of Mecca had fled the city, seeing the approach of Abraha's army, the lead elephant named Mahmoud stopped and kneeled down, refusing to go further. The rest of the elephants, the rest of the elephants, hold on, I thought there were two, but okay, would not go on without the leader, and so the whole formation came to a halt. Mahmoud, the elephant, was beaten and cajoled, but would not take one more step towards Mecca. Uh, what is this about beating animals? Gib Gabriel Jibril hit Borak in the face, and now they're beating these elephants? What's up with this? This animal abuse, dude. Shh, darn it. Man. This is, you don't understand the beauty of Islam, Sam. The beauty yeah, of Islam. I'll never understand. You know, so al waqidi gives a tradition that there were 13 elephants with the army. And that's an unlucky number, right? If they had 12 elephants, it would have been fine. Yeah, 13. That's right. <laughs> and remember, this is at a time where for 600 years, there is no evidence of any elephants in that area. So you have 13 mythical elephants that came down from paradise, from Jannah, where Burak lives. 
in an area that had no elephants for about 600 years. So you don't get you know, it. You know, you know where you do find paradise. elephants, Sam? You know where you do find elephants? In a circus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Clearly> we... <laughs> yeah. So, so besides, so there were 13 elephants besides the famous one called Mahmoud. And the latter was the only one that escaped death from the shower of stones. But this would seem to oppose the tradition generally on the subject. Wakadi adds that Abraha sent to Abyssinia for the famous elephant Mahmoud specifically to join his expedition. Abraha specially told the Ethiopians, bring me the elephant called Mahmoud. Now, why would a Christian send to a Christian nation for an elephant with the name Muhammad? Exactly. Because they were already and now uh, they were already preparing because there was in their scripture the prophecy of Ahmed Mahmoud Muhammad. Come on, man. So so in fact the name Muhammad was so powerful they were naming elephants after him. That's that's because they knew if you have an elephant named after the prophet to come, you are unbeatable. What's wrong with you, Lloyd? Drink yeah. more Slurpees. So the lead elephant was a white elephant, a white elephant, a white elephant, not just any elephant. A white elephant known as Mahmoud. And here's the translate, here's the uh, what do you call the transliteration? Mahmoud here. And this is said to have stopped at the boundary around Mecca, and that elephant refused to enter. As you go, it's source of a white elephant. Okay, very special elephant. Fine, fine. Archaeological discoveries in South Arabia suggest that the year of the elephant may have been 569 or 568, as the Sasanian Empire overthrew the Aksumite. Yemenis in 570. Now, according to Muhammad Assad, the surah of the, you know, the birds that came with the stones, yes. he says it does not describe birds literally carrying small rocks. He references Al Zamakshari and Fakhr al Din al Razi, who states the words used, namely the stones of Sijil, yes, Sijil yeah. right, denote a writing, something that has been decreed by Allah, a writing, a decree. He explains that this decree by Allah was a very sudden epidemic outbreak, which according to Ibn Hisak called fever, called haspa, and smallpox called judari. The stones was the smallpox pimples. Assad concludes this points to the fact that the stone hot blows of chastisement preordained were a very sudden virulent epidemic due to the fact that the word for fever, haspa, primarily means pelting or smiting with stones in the Arabic dictionary of Khamus al-Muhit by Feruz Abadi. The word ta'ir can denote any flying creature with a bird or insect, but they got COVID, basically. <clears throat> Precisely. Now, people don't know who Muhammad Assad was. He was a Jewish convert to Islam who wrote one of the most influential Quranic translations called The Message of the Quran. I recommend all of you students of Islam, get his Quran. You can actually read his Quran and commentary on alam.org. He was a rationalist Jewish convert to Islam who tried to explain away most of the miraculous statements of the Quran. So he's trying to give you a rational explanation. It wasn't birds that pelted them with stones. It's actually <clears throat> that Allah decreed that they would get smallpox and get sick. And because of that smallpox, they couldn't fight. They had to retreat. So he had to rationalize the statement and explain it away because he was embarrassed, obviously, by what the Quran had to teach. Yeah, so these stories are all legitimately from the Islamic sources. And I mean, so they pick one and they hope that we don't notice that there's a bunch of others. Right. In Shia Hadith, al Kafi Volume 1, Imam Ali was born in the 30th year of the elephant and died in after Hijrah 40. Some scholars have placed the year of the elephant one or two decades earlier than 570. This is tradition attributed to Ibn Shaib al Sukhri in the works of Abd al Razak al Sanani, placing it before the birth of Muhammad's father. So the year of the elephant, according to Islamic sources, could well have been before the birth of Muhammad's father. So Even Sunni him. sources place it 40 years prior to the birth of Muhammad, mm -hmm. which would also be before the birth of Muhammad's father. Confused. They're all over the map, huh? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Wow. Amazing. This is a religion. By the way, a side note, uh, Lloyd, according to Muhammad, black dogs, dogs that are black, are evil, they're demons, they need to be killed. And Muhammad saw a dream of a black woman, and he took that as a sign of epidemic breaking out. <clears throat> and he saw 
a skinny Ethiopian black guy with skinny legs, skinny legs, destroying the Kaaba. And now here you say Mahmoud was white. And no wonder, because being a white elephant, not a black one, he refused to attack the Kaaba because you see, everything good is associated with white. So you are not white and I'm not white. Me must be evil. Make that connection, Lloyd. Nothing to do with Islam or racism. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do two more slides and I think we'll call it because it's a logical place to break it. So I'm, I'm, I've covered a, a few topics and I'm throwing some things into the mix, which may or may not seem connected right now, but hopefully you guys will revise this, go back over that. There will be a test. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and if you guys don't get more than 75% of the test, I won't do part five. Yeah. So, this, you know, after the next one, there'll be a Punishable. test. And be careful yeah. because the same birds may start pelting you with smallpox from Jannah. So you better be careful, you guys. Go ahead, my yeah. friend. So, so basically, so I'm throwing things together. And some of them may seem disconnected. But if you guys, hopefully you'll watch the previous episodes. And hopefully you'll start to realize that these things do connect. I'm actually, I might not do it immediately, but I do connect them. I'm putting pieces on the board. And they do connect eventually. So, so war elephants. Just as Muslims ascribed religious sensitivity to the elephants that refused to attack Mecca, so the Christians ascribed piety to some elephants visiting Constantinople. John of Ephesus wrote that the elephants raised their trunks and signed the cross. The elephants signed the cross whenever they passed a Christian church to thank God for helping them in battle. So you must wonder if the Mahouds taught the elephants some Christian sensibilities for the visit to Byzantium. So, yeah, it's possible that Maybe they got that story from the Christians. Mm, interesting. So the elephants actually stood up and did the sign of the cross. Very interesting. That's hey, what man. elephants do. Yeah, man. Like yeah. Burak flies, you know. He likes to fly from uh, Canaan to Mecca. That's his fav favorite traveling spots when he's vacationing. So, yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So I'll call it off to this slide. And then maybe we can just, you can give me your feedback and thoughts and uh, if there's any questions from the audience. But um, so the word haram among the Bedouin. It's a sacred area around the shrine, a place where holy power manifests. Now, okay, fine and well. I mean, maybe or maybe it's not tied to idolatry in that the God is manifested into the location, right? You localize the God to a given location. Okay, and the sacred territory of Mecca is called the Haram. Now, Al Haram Ain are the two holy places, usually Mecca and Medina, but Few people realize that in Islam, al haramain are also Jerusalem and Hebron. Because there's one scholar, I, you know, if I don't take the note, if I don't write down the reference or copy the file or add it to my library, then I forget it happens on occasion, which annoys me. But there's a, there's a book I was reading where this one scholar was saying, well, one of the names of Mecca is Jerusalem, or one of the names of Jerusalem is Mecca. Hmm. So they were, they, they were trying to make a link between Mecca and Mecca. But they claim ownership of Abraham and Jerusalem and Hebron, the two places which link to Abraham as well. Mm. Okay. Mm. Oh, sorry, what was that last comment? Did I miss anything? Um, he was saying Momo certainly didn't oh. think this double scrutiny would ever take place. Yeah, he didn't know that this is what's going to come and destroy him and his credibility. Yeah, when you start looking into magic in Islam, you start looking into, remember we mentioned Samia before, that word Samia, yeah. letter magic. You start looking into that, man. It, Good grief. Islam just starts to look weird. It's crazy. So in Surah 4, 125, in which Abraham is described as Hanif, it is stated that in addition, that God took Abraham as a friend, the Khalil, hence the later designation of Hebron, the alleged burial place of Abraham, as Al-Khalil. Yep. Okay. In his dissertation, blah, 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 Hitmakan Shafiest, okay, Meccan festivals, or, okay, it was not until the Hijra, right, so, okay, Snook Hergronier brought together and interpreted all of these facts which are documented in the Quran in a synthesis which traces their historical development. Okay? He concluded that it was not until after the Hijra that Muhammad, on the occasion of his controversy with the Jews, where the Jews told him to get lost, pronounced the Old Testament patriarch, Abraham, a Hanif, and the first Muslim, and maintained that he, together with Ishmael, the ancestor of the Arabs built the Kaaba. It is only after the Jews told Muhammad that he was talking poop that he said, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Abraham was the very first Muslim. 
I'm the first Muslim. My wife was the first Muslim. Adam was the first Muslim. Yeah. But Abraham so, was the first Muslim and he built the Kaaba, except he rebuilt it because Adam built it, but it wasn't there when when Hagar got there. So Abraham built it and he built it with whatever. Yeah. So and so Islam was able to claim to be the religion of pure monotheism, already propagated by Abraham, and this claim gave it priority over both Judaism and Christianity. So priority over Moses and Jesus by claiming to be at the root of the of the the Yahwist movement. Now I want to know something as you're going to your final slide. I didn't know you're Christian Prince. CP means Christian Prince. So is he talking about me? Because I'm not Christian Prince. So are you Christian Christian Prince? Are you sure about that? Because he said, nice seeing you, CP, Christian Prince. So this guy thinks either I'm Christian Prince or you're Christian Prince because I'm not him. And I'll be shocked. All this time, I didn't know you're Christian Prince. So Lloyd, you got two identities, huh? Nothing to do with Islam, but go ahead. Sorry, guys. It's, you know, it's time I reveal myself, my real name. I'm Batman. Nothing to do with Islam. Okay. Yeah, so so yeah, I just had to, you know. Okay, so so understand historically the claim to Abraham comes very late. Muhammad does this as a reaction. It's not an early reference, it's a late. And I'm not CP. Okay, so Haram Ayn from the Arabic dual form of Haram, meaning the two sanctuaries, is is the traditional Islamic name of the two holiest cities of Islam, Mecca and Medina. But it also refers to Jerusalem and Hebron. They have to try and claim ownership of Abraham and thus Jerusalem and Hebron. And haram, okay, adjective, plural, ahram, or ahramat, originally meant pyramid, preeminently the pyramid of Cheops and Chephren. Wow. So that's what originally meant, the word ahram. Ahramat was the word they used for a pyramid. Wow, so that's interesting. All wow. of this ties back to Egypt, ultimately. All of this ties back to Hermeticism. So home is Trismegistus, the whole pagan god story. That's a long story for another day. Laughably funny story. Uh, interesting, but stupid. And Madame Blavatsky and people of that type. So, yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll pause here. I think it's good. I've gone two hours and 15, 10 minutes. Yes. And so I thoughts? will from now on. Yeah, from now on, guys, we will do Thursday. I was just assuming he'd send me a thumbnail. But God willing, it will be Thursdays. I'll just use the same thumbnail. Thursdays at the same time, because that's most convenient for him. Sorry for more of my slip up because I was waiting for him. To, I thought he's was good. It's relaxed. It's Friday. There's no rush, you know. So it's no fine. So today. Thursdays, God willing, we'll try to keep it every Thursday at the same time until you finish this series and do all the series, if God wills, unless something happens and I can't be around Thursday. But I want you to hear the last quote that he he gave you. Did you hear? Because this is something you have to remember. The claim that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba was a claim that Muhammad made only after he migrated to Medina. I want you to keep this point in mind. So according to the chronology of the Quran, based on later Muslim sources, the scholars are looking at these surahs that are supposedly in Mecca, and then the surahs composed in Medina, and they're seeing, hmm, in Mecca... There's hardly any connection between Abraham, Ishmael, and Muhammad. It's only after he migrates to Medina that you start seeing these references to Abraham and Ishmael and other characters. And so the scholars take that as proof that it's only after Muhammad interacts with the Jews in Medina, because according to Muslim sources, Medina was a hotbed of Jewish activity. There were many Jewish tribes. And as he's interacting with the Jews, that's when the Quran starts trying to connect Muhammad and Islam with Abraham and Ishmael. So pay attention to that. So if we go with the traditional narrative of Islam, then Abraham and Ishmael start popping up as having some connection with Islam in the Medinan period when Muhammad settled there and interacted with Jews to legitimize his claim and his religion <coughs> as going back to Abraham. And now, guys, click on those links. I'll try to put them in the description box. This is all Lloyd's material. I already have the link to his YouTube channel. Subscribe, support him prayerfully and financially, and make sure you're going to his channel because he's got a lot more information there already 
sessions where he's gone in depth on these topics. So we're playing catch up to what he has already done in detail on his YouTube channel. So brother, any final comments on your part? I uh, know. So your thoughts, what are you learning, Sam? What are you getting from this? Um, how does this fit with the, what you already know of Islam and your knowledge of history and so on? And uh, is it making this sense? Is where, uh, this is where I'm poor when it comes to history and geography, especially pre-Islamic, pre-Christian history and geography. What's wonderful about this is you're citing sources that are not from Islamophobes who have an agenda to destroy Islam. These are simply historical writings, archaeological inscriptions, and facts are facts. Facts don't care for your feelings. And you're showing how widespread, how dominant moon worship was in Mesopotamia, in Arabia, in those regions, in the Levant. Moon worship was widespread and dominant. And as we now start slowly bringing these lines together as they converge, it will now prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the Allah of the pagan Arabs was indeed the moon god, thereby confirming and vindicating, as I said previously, the claims of the late Dr. Robert Morey, who's not around to see this research. So this is amazing. So when Morey made popular the view that Allah of pre-Islamic Arabia was the moon god, he stands vindicated. Glory to Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Islam has nothing to do with the God of Abraham. He has nothing to do with Yahweh. He was a pagan moon deity that Muhammad then took and tried to turn into the God of Abraham. That's where the evidence is pointing to.